All right, I'm going to call to order our regular board meeting for Wednesday, July 28th, 2021. Um, how about now? Okay. So welcome. Uh, we do have a translation in Spanish, or do we have? We do not currently have a translation in Spanish. Okay. All right. Um, if someone would like to speak to an item on the agenda, they must complete a speaker card and hand that to Eva Renteria uh, prior to the agenda item. Each speaker will have two minutes. So I will move on to item 3.2, the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Trustee Sook, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you. On item 3.3, uh, superintendent comments. Dr. Rodriguez, do you have any comments for us this evening? Yes, thank you so much. So if you could put up the two flyers for me. So this week is actually a national reading week. So it's the literacy reading week. Um, most people are here, but especially the board is aware that we for the last five years have been doing a significant push on literacy and making significant gains. Um, and so if you look over here, um, not there for some reason, but if you look over here, you'll see that, um, that our district was actually highlighted on Monday as um, one of the districts that is doing significant work on literacy around for us, it's around SIPs. And so I spoke on this panel. Um, we were in really great company, so we had, um, LA County was there, um, as well as the superintendent from Oakland um, and um, some consultants. And so we were, um, we were there um, really highlighting the good work that we're doing. So thank you to the board for supporting that effort. Um, we now are at 17, all 17 schools and impacting almost 7,000 children with the work that we're doing every year. So. And then on the, the other one, I just want to note, we're going to be doing Rally in the Valley. So we have um, all the nonprofits and our major partners. We have about 60 of our major partners. Um, we're all going to be engaging in um, some softball um, a couple of weekends from now. So we have about 30 of us um, that are going to be participating in this fundraiser. And um, all the organizations got together and voted, and um, all proceeds are going to be going to um, Aslan Sector, um, and that's a really great um, program that supports our students here within the district. Um, and so um, we hope that you can come out and see us. It will be at Watsonville High, and um, we are being supported, and so I appreciate um, the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation is supporting um, the purchase of our shirts, so they're sponsoring the team, um, and we intend to win. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rod. We'll move on to item 3.4, our governing board comments and our report on standing uh, committee meetings. This is the opportunity for each board member to make a few comments. Um, we will start with uh, Trustee DeSerpa. I'll defer my comments. Trustee Soto. I as well, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Holm. It's been a busy last month or so. Um, I was able to visit Camp Connect at Cesar Chavez um, School to see all the kids back on campus and excited to be there. Um, I was also able to go out to Parkrow Park um, with the Library Bookmobile, which PBSD did sponsor um, through their extended learning program, the reading pro summer reading program for the kids. Um, we passed out food also um, through Community Bridges to um, children in our community. Um, I also attended the Azteca soccer program put on by Dina Castaneda, who is working with Pajaro Valley Sports Foundation at Freedom Elementary. Um, wonderful program to support youth and um, highly encouraged to um, be involved at Freedom Elementary and help them um, get some kids out on the field there to play soccer and other um, fun activity. 
and I've been working with Trustee Orozco on some of tonight's um, items to make some positive. Trustee Orozco? Um, so I also, uh, in addition to uh, the items, the action items that we have on tonight, um, I did get the opportunity to attend the Carl Valley Education Week, and our board of directors are very happy to announce that we will open our fund um, for families and students to apply starting next month. Uh, this fund is meant to assist families uh, financially for family uh, if they need. Uh, money for rent, groceries, just a item. Uh, we will provide more information as soon as we open. We also have a couple of fundraiser events coming up, um, including our Paro Valley Education Foundation, 1K, 5K, um, annual turkey trot, in benefit of our PBUS community. This event will be held November 20th, 21, um, along with our innovator of the year, Save the Cheat. Our innovator of the year will be held uh, June 2nd, 2022 at 6 p.m. And our auction, uh, Beer Talk, will follow that event. Um, in addition to that, I'm looking forward to school visits, starting with Rolling Hills School tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We, we can't. Um, I can't really have a yeah. conversation with you right now, but it is, yeah, the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation is the nonprofit that exists. Mm -hmm. Trustee Acosta? Um, I will defer in light of our pretty. Trustee Dodge Jr. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, just quickly, I was able to visit the Migrant and Summer Education Program at Holland Elementary School. Uh, thank you, PBUSD and the Migrant Ed Program for putting on the summer program. It was great, and a lot of kids enjoyed all the time they had out there. Um, we have a joint city of Watsonville, PBUSD, Mellow Center, and JPA coming up soon, so I'll report back on what's happening with the Mellow Center. Um, i also like to thank the district and the city of Watsonville for repairing the streets in front of Watsonville High School. Uh, hopefully we can get cars to slow down right there. So I'd just like to thank the city and the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'd also like to thank Barbie Gomez, who currently is raising money to buy the rings for the Watsonville High School girls softball team um, of champions again this year. So I'd like to say thank you, Barbie, and go Cat. Thank you, girls softball team. And i also like to say um, thank you, PVUSD, for working on EA Hall. If you pass by E Hall, you see there's a lot of construction going on, so uh, I'm excited for all the things that are happening in E Hall. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. I wanted to acknowledge a few, um, the following donations, they're listed in our um, consent agenda items, but I just wanted to bring the public attention to them. So Ginny Solara Masri for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching uh, Kitchen Project for $10,000. Janice Ost for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project, also $10,000. Uh, Kimberly Serpa uh, for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project, $1,000. Nan Sherrod for the same Emerald Lagasse Culinary uh, Gardening Kitchen, uh, Teaching Kitchen Project, $500. Um, Claudia M. Crosetti for $500. And Mel's Colonial Chapel for $2,000. For the the uh, teaching kitchen project, and and Andrea and Bruce Wiley for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project, five hundred. And Keith Severinsen um, for the Emerald Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project for five hundred dollars. And the community support for this project is incredible. The wonderful for our community. Um. That we will move on to item four, four point one, approval of the agenda. Uh, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. All right, got a first and a second. I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. 
Um, moving on to item 5.1, approval of the June 23rd, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? So approved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries unanimously. Um, item 5.2, approval of the July 21st, 2021 board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? To approve. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. We'll move on to section six. So item 6.1 is the public hearing for the California School Employees Association Chapter 132, our sunshine proposal for the 2020-2021 school year to the Pajo Valley Unified School District. Uh, the report will be presented by Brian Saxon and our, our Certificated Director of Human Resources. All right. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Brian Saxton. I'm the Director of Certificated Personnel, and uh, I'm here to discuss our Sunshine proposal. Uh, first, I just need to note that there is a typo. The word to in that proposal should be changed to from. All right. So uh, in order to discuss anything in negotiations, the district must sunshine the necessary articles, first in a public hearing and then with approval of the board. During negotiations with CSEA, we collectively found value in opening or sunshining Article 12 entitled Vacation. By opening this article for negotiations, it allows us flexibility in what we can offer to CSEA. It is recommended that the Board of Trustees accepts the sunshine proposal from PBUSD to CSEA for the 2021 school year for the following article from the master contract, Article 12 titled Vacation. So thank you for your time, and that is the uh, information. Give us a sec. Are there any public speakers to this item? Any questions or comments from the board? So we will All move. Right. Thank you. All right, we will move on to section seven, uh, our visitor non-agenda items. Uh, for item 7.1, public comment, do we have any public comments? Yes, we do, President Holm. So I'm gonna call three people up to the podium if you could line up and then you each have two minutes to speak. Okay, so the first, please forgive me if I mispronounce the name. Carol Bjorn, Julie, Dr. Dina Riggin. Uh, Vice Clerk, um, Dr. Tell the rest of us how many cards. Oh. Right now, 14. And Just to clarify, you say right now 14, but all cards should be in prior to the comments speak, right? So yes, 14. I had one more That's correct. Today, so I yes, had 14. 14 Thomas. should be the total. For Good evening. My name is Carol Bjorn. Numerous studies and the CDC confirm that children are at an incredibly low risk of severe disease long-term side effects, and even death for, from COVID-19, with a mortality risk substantially less than that from influenza, or even common activities such as riding in a car or swimming. Numerous studies found low case rates in countries where schools did not require masks, and studies published by the CDC and the COVID-19 School Response Dashboard found no difference in case rates between schools with and without student mask mandates. In the past, um, we did not require any kind of mask, quarantines, testing, vaccination, or any significant measures for flu season. And it turns out that during the 2017 through 2018 flu season, it was very deadly for children. There were 600 children that passed away from the flu during that year, yet we did not have any kind of draconian measures like we have today. Um, as I talked last month to you all, um, masks actually promote um, bacterial infection, and that was noted in a report by Dr. Fauci, if you guys remember my public comment last month. I would like to ask for you all to have mask choice for all the students, K through 12 at PVUSD this fall and continuing. 
And um, just please be aware that um, any kind of mask requirement is going to affect, it's going to impact the child's language development, emotional development, interpersonal communication, and overall well-being of the, of the students in their physiological and psychological health. So it really is in the best interest of all the kids um, to have math choice. It's everybody's individual choice. Every family can choose what they would like to do. Thank you very much. Before my timer starts, um, I have a stack of copies, just single copies from the Children's Health Defense. I invite you all to look at that because I'm going to be referring to that. Thank you. Okay, good evening. My name is Dr. Dina Riggins. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. I've been a healthcare provider, healthcare professional for over 20 years, and I have heard the mantra, follow the science, so adamantly shouted while simultaneously being ignored. We have a virus with a 99.997% survival rate with children under the age of 18, with little or no risk of transmission, and yet you continue to say, that this must be worn. There is no law that dictates the districts in the California that they must obey the CDC or State Department of Health guidelines. In fact, I would like to see this in written format under a legal statute for California. You will find a notice that I was referring to that it's, um, it maps out that this is a violation of federal law. All masks, no matter what kind, are not approved or licensed by the federal government. These are emergency use authorization products and are by definition experimental and thus require the right for refusal. Under the Nuremberg Code, which is the foundation of ethical medicine, no one may be coerced to participate in a medical experiment. That also includes the jab. There is no evidence that the mask works against viral spread. It increases their breathing resistance, our CO2 rates, your heart rate it increases, your, your um, blood pressure, respiratory rate. Blood oxygen saturation is decreased even more so in children, decrease in cardiopulmonary capacity, that's heart and lung, ability to concentrate and the ability to think, why would we wanna do this to our children? In addition, the side effects, and I've noted in my private practice alone, increase in headache, shortness of breath, dizziness, skin problems, and in particular, and most important in my opinion, is the psychological mind mess of humans and our babies. The WHO admitted in 2020 that the mask policy was not due to any scientific evidence. It was only for politics. I recommend that we keep our children out of the politics and beware that your school is going to be empty and you're not gonna make any money. Hi, my name is Julie Skelton, and I'm very nervous. Um, I've never had to speak out like this for my children, um, but I feel like now is my time. Um, I've lived in Santa Cruz for 30 years, and I'm here to speak on behalf of my two sons and all the parents who feel like they've lost their rights, freedom, and control over their children's health. We say that kids are resilient and adaptive, and while they are, they are also impressionable, sensitive, and prone to anxiety and depression more than ever. During this pandemic, children have become anxious, confused, and depressed. I've seen it firsthand. And for what reason? Why have we roped children into this mess of a virus that doesn't affect them? The COVID child mortality rate is at a 0 to 0.26% in the USA. While we all acknowledge that the death of a child is terribly sad, it's also a very low number, and it doesn't justify these strict protocols for children. The temperatures, the sanitizer, the constant reminder to keep distance from friends, the mask. Little kids don't understand this and shouldn't need to. My six-year-old son tried out summer camp this year. I came to pick him up after his first day and he was in tears. Said he was forced to wear a mask outdoors when they said that that wouldn't be required and to stay three feet away from his friends. I'm concerned for the unknown impact this has on early childhood social development. Please show me the science that says the virus spreads rapidly outdoors and among children. You can't. You really can't. My older son, who had to start seeing a therapist last spring, he had to start seeing a therapist last spring when he was seven, 
because he was ripped out of school and church and was told he needed to cover up his face because he might have a virus that could kill someone. This is fear driven and we need to finally look at the science and free these children of confusion and lies. Let's let the children be children. Masks are silently taking a mental and emotional toll on our kids. So let's be their advocates and fight for their rights and bring their smiles back. I will call the next three people. Okay, the next three speakers. Okay, please, if, so you can, everybody can hear. So I'm gonna call the next three speakers. Um, David Ferepa, Dr. Krista Healy, and Matt Montgomery, please come to the podium. Uh, Gary Richard Arnold, man. Um, sir, we're going, I'm going in order. So I'm calling people oh, okay. to the podium. They're under seven, two. I thought you just named four people. Oh, okay, no. I had to call no, no problem. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, I could start by telling you how the guidance provided by the state and the federal government is flawed and urge you to reevaluate your stance, but that would be futile as it seems you have already made your mind up, come to your determination, and hide behind deflection, finger pointing, and Gail Newell's skirt. Instead, I will direct your attention to two vocabulary words and one universal truth throughout human history. Tyranny, unjust or oppressive governmental power, despot, a person who wields power oppressively. Tyranny never lasts, and despots are inevitably deposed. Those of us that are paying attention know exactly where this leads. After the masks come the vaccines. A vaccine that is poison, untested, and not a vaccine as the general public has come to understand them from years past. We risk poisoning the future generations by allowing our personal fears of adult health run amok. While there is a litany of historical analogies I can draw from, the most appropriate in my estimation is that, is that of Horatius. In ancient Rome, Horatius, along with two other friends, defended the narrow end of a bridge from an advancing and overwhelming army so that his brothers and sisters could destroy the bridge behind him and stop the advance of the invading horde. The abuse of our children and the tyrannical overreach of government officials is what we will make our stand against. Together with other parents and like-minded individuals, we will defend the well-being of our children. I will leave you with this final thought. As Horatius faced the advancing army with friends by his side, the lays of ancient Rome record him as saying, to every man upon earth, death cometh soon or late, and how can man die better than facing fearful odds for the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods? There is no greater and more worthy fight to be had than for our children. We will face the odds and we will do what we must. Escape is never the safest plan. I'm Dr. Krista Healy. I'm a chiropractor and I have a bachelor's degree in science. <laughs> I have two girls at PVUSD and I'm a health advocate for them and my patients and my friends and family. I'm happy that things are a lot different than they were this time last year. We now have preventative treatment, early treatment, and a vaccine. Although early treatment is still political and if none is given to you, I encourage all of you to get a second opinion, seek care from a holistic MD, DO, or natural path. But I do have some issues coming up with school year besides mass, um, one is water. When they did hybrid, they had no access to water. You guys closed down all the fountains. Please bring them back. Two, food. I'm happy to hear that your menu has changed, looked way better, but I wish there was ingredients on the website. I really hope you got rid of, the, of those microwaved and plastic mystery food. It's disgusting. Number three, exercise. These kids are so out of shape. Please make sure they get PE with no mask, they need to work out. They're so out of shape. And everyone knows that COVID, one of the pre-consisting conditions is obesity. And our kids are fat right now. <laughs> Number four, fresh air. I really hope you can convince Gail Newell that we don't have to wear masks to school like all the other districts that are happening in California that have opted out. And the 41 states that have opted out of masks. Um, please give them more time outside. Give them a place if you're not gonna give us a mass choice to go if they have a headache or brain fog or skin issues or start to feel overheated because of the side effects from breathing too much CO2. I feel masks will handle learning. They will impair linguistic skills, harm the heart, the heart of healing and kids with glasses who can't see because they're constantly fogged up um, and make it difficult for kids to read facial cues. That's an important thing. Like you guys are up here and I can't even tell who's talking. <laughs> 
psychology. Our kids are messed up right now. They're so depressed. They have so much anxiety. My niece can't even leave the house without having a panic attack and cry. Okay. Um, my kids have had to go to therapy because I think if they hug their grandma, they're going to give her COVID. They think that their teacher who's retiring a year early is going to die if she stays an extra year. You said time and that. Good evening. Thank you for listening to us speak. My name is Matt Montgomery. My oldest child is five years old and entering kindergarten this year. Unlike me, he will not be attending Rio Del Mar Elementary or any public school this year. The reason is that we are opposed to the state and district's embrace of pseudoscience and hysteria with this mask requirement. Let's dispel the notion that this is in any way necessary to protect kids. Children are at lower risk for this virus than the flu. You know it. We know it. The next excuse we hear is that we must mandate masks to protect, around, protect adults around the children. At this point, every adult who could possibly want a vaccine has been afforded that opportunity. There is no longer an excuse for imposing a burden on children. Mask proponents cannot point to a single randomized controlled trial showing masks have any protective effect for the wearer or for those around them. Such evidence does not exist. Every randomized controlled trial for masks, whether with COVID in Denmark or with the CDC's own study on influenza prior to 2020, showed no detectable effect. None. Let's look to the real world. Governor Newsom implemented the statewide mask mandate on June 18th of 2020, when our state reported an average of 3,347 cases per day. Six months later, on December 22nd, our daily average peaked at over 44,000 cases per day, an increase of 1,232% with masks mandated the entire time. If masks work to such a degree that we must force them onto our children's faces for eight hours per day, shouldn't we expect actual studies and real world results to back them up? Masks are nothing more than a talisman designed to give people a false sense of control in the face of a scary natural phenomenon. Please at least make them optional. Thank you. Okay, next speakers, Christina Morgan, Kristen Hurley, and Matt Wright. Good evening, respected members of the board. My name is Christina Morgan, and I have served as a reading intervention teacher at McQuitty for the past 10 years. I am here to advocate for my students as well as my own two children attending McQuitty this August. Um, first of all, thank you so much for hearing teacher and parent concerns about learning loss and hiring an additional intervention teacher at each site. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, the majority of my students, those with the greatest need for reading support, who were already a year or more behind in reading, were unable to access consistent SIPs instruction online. These students have effectively missed a year and a half of reading instruction and they need clear modeling and corrective feedback. So I tell them to watch my mouth, and they need to hear the difference between and or and and I don't know if you could hear me, but my students can't. Um, in turn, I need to be able to see their mouths to ensure that they are learning correctly. So to me, it is laughable to imagine a scenario in which I can successfully support my students while we all have our mouths muffled in this way. Reading is hard enough and the masks add yet another barrier to learning. Now, I do not take health and safety lightly. I rely on data to weigh the risks and benefits of the choices I make daily as a parent. Um, as you've heard, the data is overwhelming, overwhelmingly showing that children under 18 have an extremely low risk of dying from COVID. Um, and then a recent Johns Hopkins study, there was not one single case of death in otherwise healthy children from COVID. So um, I believe parents should have the choice of whether or not to mask their child. Um, I certainly sympathize with other communities around the world who are truly struggling to fight the spread of COVID, but the reality here in Santa Cruz 
um, is we okay for the past six months we've had a running average seven day zero deaths since March. Thank you. Hi guys, I'm Kristen Hurley. Um, and I, I'm here tonight knowing that every single one of you guys wants to do the right thing. And we're all here tonight to help achieve that for everyone, for our students and our community. Um, and something I've heard a lot of, we've all been at other district meetings and the county office of education meetings this summer in the last month or two. And we hear a lot of, it's out of our hands and we don't have any say in the matter with respect to masks or certain COVID guidelines locally. Oh, it's the state and I've heard reference to hiding behind skirts of local health officers and or the California Department of Public Health. And that is just not true. Um, in fact, the CDPH did come out and say that enforcement of their guidelines, guidelines not law, right, is um, going to be left up to the local district. So we're here to advocate for that. And I want to let you guys know that you're not alone in wanting to do the right thing. You guys still hear me in that? Uh, um, there are other districts around California that are already making the choice um, to allow masks to be recommended but not required in their, in their schools. And I just want to quote a few things. So this is Corona Norco District, which is Riverside County. Um, this is from a recent board meeting. Um, the board's deciding all five CNUSD trustees want mask wearing to be a matter of individual choice, a decision to be made by staff and parents of whether or not to, fa to wear face coverings. Furthermore, this unified school district staff was instructed to reach out to other districts locally and other counties to form a coalition of districts supporting a mask policy of choice. Um, we see the same thing out of Tulare County in the district there. Um, they commented students have uh, been attending gatherings, engaging in organized and unorganized sporting and play events, dining out with family and friends, interacting daily without masks in their lives. Why are we bringing it back for school? And I could go on. I think We're there's, time. thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like you guys to join forces with those other districts that are making the right decision on it. Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Renda and uh, I live here in Watsonville. I want to express my appreciation uh, for you allowing us to come here, show up in person. Uh, there are a lot of public bodies across the state of California that aren't allowing people to show up and you know, express their desires, so I am appreciative. Um, I'm here to ask you uh, to give um, us the choice to mask or unmask uh, our children. I was prepared uh, to read a litany of statistics, but I think that they've already been gone over. Um, I do think um, that I would like to point you to maybe an article um, that you could read um, that was uh, entitled The Kids Were Safe the Whole Time. Uh, it's by David Wallace Wells, uh, who's a writer of the New York ma Magazine. And he writes, um, to children, COVID-19 represented only a vanishingly tiny threat of disease, of death, hospitalization, or severe uh, disease. Yet for a year and a half, we have been largely unwilling to fully believe it. And I believe that masks on children in K through 12 is reflective of an unwillingness to believe the science rather than a full engagement with the science. And I also want to point to three Boston-based doctors, all right? These are not political actors. These are medical health professionals who said the insistence on universal mask wearing is not an evidence-based approach. Um, this has been, I think, well-trodden ground by previous speakers, so I'm not gonna go over it. But I do wanna say that um, California is a rarity in the United States of America in terms of this approach. Um, I have a friend, my college friend lives in Boston. Uh, so he lives in Massachusetts, his, his, his sister lives in Vermont. These are democratic liberal strongholds and his children are going to school without masks in a couple of weeks. Um, and I think that it's really important to recognize that you know, forcing our children to wear masks at this point in the pandemic, I think is a very radical and anti-science approach. Um, and I think it's also important to recognize where we are in the phase of this pandemic. This pandemic is no longer in an acute emergency phase, thankfully, because of vaccines. On July 24th, you can look up the data, there was one death in the state of California, one. 
in a state of 60 million, 60 million people. Right. So this, this pandemic is over, and I would uh, you know, encourage you to have your policies reflect that. Thank you. Our next speakers, Ann Swedelberg, Gary Richard Arnold, and Bill Beecher. Gary Richard Arnold. I believe this is actually treasonous. You know, Dr. Charles Lieber was a man from Harvard, a uh, vi virologist, went to Wuhan University. I read a 19-page affidavit where he's getting millions of dollars from the Red Chinese. He only got six months in prison. He's already released. Just like Dianne Feinstein's uh, so-called cabbie. He's speaking over here at UCSC. And I don't know if you know, because most of the papers were bought by a cabal here with Bill Gates, et cetera, uh, the Mercury, the Sentinel, the Monterey Herald, and they are all controlled. Have you ever heard of Panetta Gate? Leon Panetta gave military and policy information to the communist Chinese, and there are two monuments on the, on the courthouse steps right now dedicated to that communist spy. Bruce McPherson received $30,000 from Katrina Lung, front page of U.S. News and World Report, a Chinese communist spy, the person that shut down the various businesses and dictated all the policy in the Central Bay Area came from the Community Foundation by David Packard, a trilateralist who funded Gary Patton, who advocated that we don't defend Grenada and that the communists build a submarine place and a uh, airport there. There are communist roots uh, to this, including the Red Chinese including the Republican Central Committee here, which is controlled by Leon Panetta, and other globalists. People have no place to go because they're so damn clueless. You need to look up also, uh, because it's just about cut off here, but I see you've got uh, some one of your 60 partners here. It says a, a national supporter wants to harness your children right here uh, to uh, accomplish uh, his uh, stakeholder perceptions. And I see... It's, you're not training the individual for the individual. It's for the global community. You got America wrong. You should be replaced. Hi, I'm Ann Swedberg, and I'm a retired PBUSD teacher. And I just wanted to weigh in on the masks. I really feel that very strongly that children should not be masked. Um, I think that the mass decrease, of course, decrease the amount of oxygen that the student can breathe, thereby reducing the amount of, of learning that the child will take in. Um, and the masks themselves have significant health and safety issues, um, not much less having trying to keep them on little five and six year olds. Um, but more than that, I think the psychological effect on children is so great. Um, the depression, the anxiety, the fear that masks give children, um, just very, um, I think it is a long-term effect that we really should think. So I would really ask you to consider allowing parents and children to decide if they want to be math. Thank you. Good evening. I'm here to give you a break. I'm here also to make a request for an agenda item, a formal request. Each school year for the last several years, I've asked that a review of our health care plan be done. Nothing's happened. This has never been put on the agenda in spite of the $60 million that we spend each year. That is more than 20% of your budget. The Brown Act calls out that individuals can request the board for agenda items and that the board, the district, is supposed to put some of these requests on the agenda at a future time. In 14 years, I have not seen either my requests or those of trustees put on the agenda. You disregard the spirit of the Brown Act. At my age, I cannot wait any longer. So I've got six things that I have asked in the past. I'm not going to go over them other than the sixth one, which is why aren't we self-insured? 
There's a lot of data that large organizations, greater than a thousand, are much better off self-insured. They save a lot of money. We have over 3,000 in our plan. In the past, the agenda committee has not responded to the requests for agenda items. You should change that in the future. People deserve a response, even if it's negative. Change of subject. Trustee Daniel Dodge ran on a platform that the incumbent had old, outdated ideas. He had new ones. If today includes being involved in two Brown Act violations and a recent embezzlement charge, then bring back the past. I was judged on leading by example. Trustee Dodge fails this and sets a poor example for our students. What are you thinking? Do you want your children to follow in your example? I would ask that you resign from the board. Thank you for your time. And last speaker, Erica Stanojevic. Hi, <clears throat> thank you for your time tonight. So you guys have heard a lot from all the speakers tonight, and I think it's just very clear. Not I'm sorry, we're recording and it's streaming okay. live. Yeah, so it was just hard to, it feels I know, like it's I'm not. I'm so sorry, but Got people want to hear you okay. who are watching at home. So there's a lot of districts around the state that are not choosing to enforce mask policy, and that's the choice that you have. So basically, you can simply say that the district will not choose to enforce it, and that will actually help protect your, you guys legally because there's so much evidence that masks are not actually necessarily safe for children. And that's really what this comes down to. In the end, there's a lot of studies that show potential harm for people who are wearing masks for extended periods, and there's not evidence that there's safety for those same people. More than that, schools have not been shown ever to be a hot spot of transmission, and so there's not danger to the community. So we know there's not danger to the community. We know there's not danger to our children. So why do we persist in having an activity, having them cover their face, which may be harmful to the children themselves? It simply doesn't make sense. And I know that you guys want to make the right choice, and you guys have that before you. The choice is pretty simple. Have mask choice be, be not enforced. So the policy is just you don't enforce it, very simple. And the last thing I'll just say is, um, you know, there's, there's just so much different evidence of different things. So right here is just this little graph you can maybe see. Um, the blue ones are student infection rates where, forced, where, masks, where children are forced to wear masks, and it's much higher infection rates of COVID than in areas where they're not forced to wear masks. Because of course, guess what? Children get them dirty. It's just not actually a safe policy. And you guys all know that. You know what's true in your hearts. So we just ask a simple choice. Make, you know what's right in your hearts. You do. I know you do. So simply ask. So make the policy. And once you guys do, you time. can join other districts in the state and around the country. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so we'll move on to Section 8, uh, Employee Organization Comments. Now is the time that we hear from our employee organizations. Each will have five minutes. I will start with uh, PVFP. I'm just to let you know we can't engage in conversation because of the Brown Act not an agendized item. Hey, good evening, board. I don't know if I can I just wait a minute. I was really relying on this audience. Darn it. Okay, I'm gonna start. Good evening, board, President Holm, VP Shocker, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, it has been nice to have these meetings in person as opposed to Zoom. 
We would again like to commend all educators who have tra helped transform and transition their practice to a virtual setting at a quick pace. And despite some having a few more challenges than others, they demonstrated to their students how to overcome fear, learn new modalities, and improve their practice to ensure they deliver daily lessons. We always commend our support staff too, who were not able to go remote for not um, to go remote for not missing a beat and continuing to support transport, feed, check in on, and support students who presented at school sites. These are strong examples our students benefit in witnessing the confrontation of a threat to our public health by collaborating and finding solutions to overcome and persevere. The risk to public health is still present and we are all tasked with a call to work together to combat the virus. While our younger students are not yet able to be vaccinated, it is on us all to ensure the safety of everyone by wearing a mask. Do teachers want to spend a day in a mask? Absolutely not. But the lives of our students are precious to us and we already have a lot to grieve over. The state is requiring masks. This is not a conversation of negotiations between ourselves and the district. The districts who are choosing to opt out of this mask mandate will go to court. It is, mandatory, it is a mandatory requirement. It is for the right reasons, public health, despite what an, any individual may personally believe. We request the energy and passion for the best public school experience for our students to be focused on funding public education. Without highly qualified educators in our classrooms and in professional service positions, your student is missing out on consistent learning experience or specialized care. Many districts are vying for the same small pool of education professionals, and we are losing teachers due to cost of living in this area. I would like to thank the district for reinstating the $125 stipend to educators to purchase classroom materials. This is helpful but please consider applying the cost of living allotment to the salary schedule so we can slow the loss of staff due to pay. Do so without going on about the cost of healthcare. We understand premiums and how they've increased by just about 2% for this coming um, year. Our students need fully credentialed teachers and professional staff. Making the argument for a raise on, admin on administrative salaries, which includes benefits to attract and retain district admin, is not only for that tier of professionals who make a tier whom already make a pretty sustainable wage to, to live in this area. It is detrimental to our students that they have teachers and professional staff working directly with them daily. Finally, thank you trustees for the environmental sustainability resolution. This first, this first step to commemorate the promise by the district to take, a get, take action is good. We hope to see the committee work with the Ag Commissioner to protect school sites from pesticide drift. And hopefully every elementary school will have the opportunity to go to science camp without having to spend all year raising funds or then potentially missing out, which is what happened to my fifth grade students in my first year of teaching in this district. It was de devastating for them after an entire year of fundraising. We look forward to working with the district as we enter a new school year. Thank you. Nelly. Uh, next up is uh, CSEA. Do we have any representative from CSEA to speak tonight? Do we have anyone from Pavam? <laughs> Sorry. I thought I was last. I didn't realize I was going to be third. All right. Uh, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Brian Saxton. It's my pleasure to present these remarks on behalf of PAVAM. This summer, many administrators and managers have been continuing their effort to mitigate learning loss by working a variety of different summer sessions. In addition to finalizing the school year or preparing for the upcoming year, these administrators served as site summer school principals and enrichment program directors and much more working with teachers to ensure that students have every opportunity to grow and succeed, they are helping to ensure success for all students. Currently, we are running summer school at almost all of our elementary and secondary sites. Most of these schools are being led by a PAVAM administrator. Assistant superintendents, directors, coordinators, 
and site administrators have all stepped up for this final push before the new school year begins. Some of these people are first year principals or they are new to their site or even new to the district. Regardless, they have all committed to being there each day for their students. The students who are attending our summer session will be able to head into the new year on solid footing, thanks to these administrators. Speaking of the new year, I'm sure that you have seen the new theme for the year, PVUSD CARES. District administrators will play a vital role in making sure that this motto is fulfilled. Having worked with the majority of PAVAM members, I can truly say that they care. I'm excited to see our administrators meet the challenge of whole child, whole family, and whole community. This challenge will include all of our PAVAM members, not just at the site. As Katie in Transportation noted, her staff is often the first and last PVUSD staff member that students see each day. How vital for Katie to work with her staff on whole child, whole family, and whole community. Linda in Food Services will need to ensure that her staff understands social and emotional learning as they hand out meals to our students. How does what they serve affect each student and how do they serve it affect each student? Casey, Lisa, Chris, Clint, Allison will need to continue to support their admin at the site and their staff at various levels as we return to full-time learning after a year and a half away. I could go on and on, but I'm sure you get the point. All of PAVAM is vital to making sure that our students and staff get the resources they need and that the planned restorative start is indeed restorative. Also, it is important for all PAVAM to remember that we too need support and to know that we can all lean on each other. PVUSD cares, thank you. Do we have anyone from CWA? We'll move on to um, section nine. So 9.1, resolution 21-22-04, environmental sustainability. The report will be presented by Jennifer Shocker, our board vice president, and Maria Orozco, our board trustee. <laughs> okay, we're tagging that, so. Um, in accordance with BB 9130, the governing board may establish a committee whenever it determines no, yeah, you're in the okay, let's, let's put the glass. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District has the responsibility to minimize its greenhouse gas emissions, demonstrate leadership, and provide education and, and actionable solutions for children. Therefore, the following resolution has been brought forward to highlight PVUSD's commitment to wisely using limited resources and avoiding environmental damage, sustaining the region's economy, helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere, implementing strategies and programs at the regional and local level to tackle environmental, social, and economic challenges, and supporting the region's unique biodiversity. To accomplish these goals, PVUSD will work with diverse residents, partners together, unify regional plans, policies, and programs that result in more health, livable, sustainable, Two major action items created called PVUS to work on projects including but not limited not limited to plastic, providing reusable water bottles, water fittings, encouraging site beautification and cleanup, and becoming the second ocean guardian district to ensure that our students are of this. And go ahead and because <laughs> it is a, a fairly it's really long. long. So, whereas the global impact challenge for climate change, society, all in all elected, and whereas access to public and nature health environment right all as that access to health, economic parity of. Whereas our changing climate represents threats to economic security, health and wellness, transportation system, infrastructure, uh, natural system, world quality of life, and whereas scientists are documenting a rapid loss of natural areas and wildlife.
there. Whereas the third national climate assessment found that climate change is reduced the ability of to provide clean water and regulate water flows, is limiting the ability to buffer communities against disaster, fires, storms, and floods, which is having a far reaching effect on marine and terrestrial wildlife, including by altering habitat, forcing migratory patterns, and altering biological events. Whereas to confront of natural systems lost biodiversity around the world and to maintain below a 1.5 degree Celsius average global temperature, scientists recommend that roughly half of the and whereas that that goal, some scientists recommended that all countries fit to conserving and protecting at 30 percent of land, 30 percent of the ocean by 2030, with a long-term goal of Whereas impact from climate change to TVUSD will be most acutely felt by children, seniors, low income populations, communities of color, and residents with economic and disruptions for climate impact, varying degrees of health, vulnerable populations, economy, and built environment, transportation, housing, water supplies, utility, and And whereas conserving and restraining. Restoring nature is one of the most efficient possible strategies for fighting climate change. Whereas the Pearl Valley Unified School District is committed to wisely using limited resources, and whereas our local communities, natural working lands, forests, range lands, farms, but coast, deserts, urban green the economy help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, atmosphere for the region's unique biodiversity. And whereas Carl Valley Unified School District has responsibility as greenhouse gas emission leadership, provide education, and and whereas the Paro Valley Unified School District will work with diverse residents and local partners together with unifying regional plans, policies, and programs that result in more healthy, livable, sustainable, and economically resilient communities. And whereas the Parho Valley Unified School District will need to adapt and become more resilient to the impact of climate change by implementing strategies and programs at the regional and local level to tackle environmental, social, and economic challenges. And whereas we work to ensure that all Parho Valley United School District students graduate as globally minded citizens. I'll therefore be at resolved Carl Valley Unified work with state and private land at the place to improve access to nature all this community of color will prohibit all balloons from the district property or in conjunction including but not limited to events for fundraising. Establish a new district wide committee called the TVS including but not limited to uh, providing reusable water bottles, water infants, print, beautification, and cleanup. This committee will help in restoring and protecting in graduate local appropriate science projects that enhance biodiversity climate Become an ocean guardian district, ensuring that our students are aware of the precious resource in our own backyard. Continue to explore renewable energy sources and zero emission energy by building or upgrading to energy efficient, distributed and smart power grid, grid sorry, and ensuring affordable access to electricity, upgrading all existing buildings in the Paro Valley Unified School District and new buildings to achieve maximum energy efficiency, water efficiency, safety, affordability, comfort and durability, including through electrification, Overhauling transportation systems in the U.S. to remove pollution, greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector as much as technologically feasible, including through investment in zero emission vehicle and non-motorized alternative modes of transportation, infrastructure and manufacturing, identifying other emissions and pollution sources and creating solutions to remove them, providing resources, training and high quality education. 
continue to explore community gardens as well as provide garden space at school sites to continue education and sustainable farming, land use practices that increase soil health and build a more sustainable food system that serves access to healthy food. Mitigate and manage the long-term adverse health, economic, and other effects of pollution and climate change by seeking grants and or providing funding for community-defined projects and strategies and working with community partners to maximize Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? There are none. Do we have any discussion? Can I make a motion By to support this resolution? Thank you for putting it. Uh, any, do I have a first? Do I have a second? Um, so I had um, a comment. Um, so I, I think that both resolutions are quite very good resolutions. Back, back up. Um, my express concern, and I've expressed concern in the past, that when any one or more bringing an action item before the board um, be voted on, I, I just have great concerns that I do believe that these recommendations as stemming staff, same as public, bringing some level staff recommendation. And as we have also seen in the past, we've had board members bring resolution items to the board who were not on the agenda setting, yet have three members on the agenda committee. So when it gets to that level, we clearly have a violation of the Brown Act. So I think we're skirting the law in, in one way here too close, and I just find it completely inappropriate for them on the title drop, especially. So, and all right, I will be abstaining from these items tonight. I'm certain of that, comfortable with past or in the future. And, and on their own right, I think they're great. Please do hear me. They are. But I just really from the staff. For second. I guess I'll, I'll uh, comment. Um, so, you know, the items before us, three items before us, actually stem from presentation that we received start life and campus elementary students. So I believe is it is the role of the board to take into those type of board and then make I assure the community uh, trustee Shocker and myself serve on the center setting committee. And this was not discussed any at any of the board members. This is something that we both um so I want to clarify. Right, and I'm not meaning to suggest that either one of them were or up, but has happened in the past. And the other being again stemming from real equity. And there is almost a level of will, of a sense of balance of power, or none of the stuff. Then the next, that not even true. the board president. I mean, her, her, or his job at that seat is to run the meetings to the folks for it. So it just stems as an imbalance of power. That's what I appropriate and. So I would just prefer the such as that 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 just there. That's my not no get himself and alone are great.
just to clarify, this was presented to us at a former board meeting, um, and it was mentioned during that board meeting that the children and the teachers working on the environmental sustainability project wish for a balloon ban, wish to have some sort of district-wide green team. They were also an Ocean Guardian school and wish to see us move forward um, in that. So we did take into consideration these requests that were made at a public meeting. And we talked with Dr. Rodriguez about the possibilities and put a report together. I have no problem if Dr. Rodriguez wants to present the next two items. Present the We have a first and well, second. No, and no, with we, regards we, to no, that, I just no, think no, that it's no. already agendized. Okay, okay, we're done. I'm sorry, it's no, just already no, agendized, so it we're is done. going forward as it is. So I'm just, we have I a was first speaking and a to second. the future, and I'm, I recall that You've made your point, meeting, you're repeating it. And thank you. Let's move on. I just, You've made your point, and you're repeating right, it. Right, and my move point on. has been tried to be rebuted, so I have a right to speak back to it, so thank you. So the nice agenda has already been agendized. We're going to move on. It's already been voted on. So we've had a I've made my point about second. what I'd like to see going forward I'd like in the to future call the vote. and my concerns. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. All right. So we are moving on to item 9.2, resolution 21-2205, banning the use of balloons. The report will be presented by Jennifer Shocker, Board Vice President, and Maria Rosco, Board Vice I have no issue presenting. As the banning of balloons resolution, um, this item before you was inspired by our very own students from the Green and Calabas Starlight Elementary. And here's a short video that had the full experience. Pull up. <laughs> okay, one, go start from the very start. Okay, ready? Go. So, I like elements. We are all guard, ocean guard. Daisy F. Like to share post. Hi, my name is and I did post. It says, let it earn. earn. You can do this now. I'm going to put this poster on my window so everybody can see it. So, clean the earth. Noah shares his poem. Hi. I wrote it for long. It is for everyone to know. It is for all year round. First for two. Like, I see it's for together with the major. And H is for happier day. Christian Guardians is a school that guards, protects, serves watersheds, ocean, and special areas like 
National Marine Sanctuaries. Escuela Guardián del Oceano. Es una escuela que vigila, protege y preserva nuestras cuencas, océano y áreas especiales como el Santuario Nacional de la Bahía Rey. En Spelly, somos miembros de una comunidad gra, 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 grande, de, grande que se llama Guardian de Ocean. So, Darwin was a word for spread our career for so fully our to care and of the public as the ocean guardian school for the Maria por nuestros esfuerzos el año pasado por la comunicación de Starlight y la comunidad de Watsonville. Dylan. We would like to invite all the to help clean up our local watershed keep balloons from entering our that that are que queremos invitar a los de nuestra comunidad a ayudar a limpiar nuestros cuerpos. Quiero remarcar que los hombres tienen los balones en su estómago, Bael. Yo no sé. 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 Balloons. They die. Aluso. Paloma. Puedes hacer banderas con papel o material. Yes. Hello. You can make bones, bones to around house or say stay of bones. You can make flowers that create bones. A table decoration by Maria. Instead of this way, we could reuse them and make things for our house. Wash the can and the can. Okay. 
See a rocket ship by Abraham. Thank you. I want to let you know we've had some parts that it's hard to hear on the microphones. So if everyone, when you are speaking, if you can be close to the microphone so that the public who is listening to the streaming broadcast can hear well. Great. Okay, so as noted by the resolution on environmental sustainability, Pajaro Valley Unified School District is committed to wisely using limited resources and avoiding environmental damage as much as possible. The availability of helium is vitally important to scientific and medical advances and is a non-renewable resource given current technology in addition. Balloons have been shown to travel long distances and remain intact when landing with the remains of balloons and their strings have deadly effect on wildlife. There are four PBUs educate students in our community about and seek to provide environmentally alternative this resolution activity of all balloons are put crop or in the are utilized by um, the night we're asking Thank you. Do we have any public speakers on this item? No speaker. Do we have any discussion from the board? Let's make a motion. No, second. The first and the second? And for the same reasons I previously cited, I'd like to note that both those items be short time. It went free. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? And one abstention is correct. All right, we're going to move on to item 9.3, PVUSD district-wide green team uh, board committee. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, our superintendent of yeah, thank you. I'll get it started. Um, so our board policy allows us, as you know, every um, every December at our organizational meeting, we establish committees in which our board members are part of. Um, we are able to continue to establish additional committees. Um, in this case, um, we have, and I know that um, that Vice President. Um, Shocker and um, Trustee Roscoe will go over them, but we have complied with our board policy. Within the board policy, we're required to identify um, certain things, including um, the committee purpose, our timeline for completion of assigned responsibilities, um, the length of the time that community committee members will, are expected to serve, and also the expectations for reporting out. And so um, I will pass it off um, to the fellow trustees. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. I'd also like to thank um, two of our teachers that um, brought this to our attention. You saw them in, in the video. And thank you, Erin Levy from Starlight. And thank you to um, Laura Arnu from Calabasas. So thank you for your hard work. Um, in accordance with BB 913A, or sorry, 9130A, the governing board may establish a committee whenever it determines that such a committee would benefit the district by providing diverse viewpoint, specialized knowledge or expertise or increased efficiency. Such committees may be subcommittees of the board or committees that include members of the community, staff or other stakeholder group. In this case, the governing board is recommending the establishment of a PVUSD district-wide green team. BB 9130A states that upon establishing a committee, the board shall clearly define the committee's purpose, any timeline for completion of assigned responsibilities, 
any stakeholder groups or individuals to be represented on the committee, length of time the committee members are expected to serve, and expectations for reporting to the board and or the superintendent or designee. The committee's purpose. The PVUSD Green Team will be to work on projects including but not limited to reducing plastic use, providing reusable water bottles and water filling stations, encouraging site beautification and cleanup. This committee will help in restoring and protecting threatened, endangered, and fragile ecosystems through locally appropriate and science-based projects that enhance biodiversity and support climate resiliency. Timeline for completion of assigned responsibilities. The committee will meet monthly to identify and create action steps aligned with established goals. The committee will use community input to identify topics of environmental justice to be addressed. Several methods will be used to gather input, including thought exchanges, Google surveys, and in-person focus groups. Equal representation um, for us committees to support and appointed by the board president to approve the superintendent or desk shall provide committee members and may serve as non voting advisor. Set up, up, up of up the three board members, superintendent or the six to elementary to second to classify staff members, three community members, city of Watson staff member, three students, stakeholders interested in being part of the white screen team may apply through uh, our group. Um, in addition, because we recognize that not all individuals with a to uh, partake in this committee. Uh, we do plan to provide opportunities to back to product. As far as the length of time of representation, stakeholder including board members of the committee and the expectation of reporting on the board, the superintendent or representatives, superintendent will speak to update the progress of the board superintendent. In addition, action and consent items will be brought forward to future board meetings unless it's specifically authorized by the board to act on behalf of the committee to advice on behalf of whatever so charged is acted guardian staff, community, students, social So with that uh board approval. Pardon me. Do we have any public speakers for this item? No public speakers, President Holm. Any discussion from the? It's a great initiative. Many other districts around our county putting together green teams. I'm glad to see that we're doing the same. Um, I'll make a motion to support. Thank you for bringing it. Like second. For the same reasons previously cited on nine nine. Thank you. All right, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? And then the one abstention. So item 9.4, my on reader, report was be presented by Lisa Aguirre uh, Lewis, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Inspection. It is there. I was wondering if it was going to appear on that. <laughs> All right. Good evening, President Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here this evening to ask for approval of the purchase of my own, uh, for the upcoming year, the 2021-2022 school year. So what is my own? My own consists of 13,000 interactive digital books. It's part of Renaissance Learning, and so it aligns with Accelerated Reader, and also the star reading assessment. It has fiction, nonfiction books that are both in Spanish and in English. Oh, okay. So how does it work? What happens is that students can choose. Um, teachers can push out certain books to students, or students can choose which ones that they um, that they will want to read, and it's based off of their likings, um, topics or different genres. 
At the end of each book, students can take a short quiz to check their comprehension. They can rate the book and they can also write a review that other students will be able to read in the future. And so in grades, um, the first and second grade, the digital resources that support the skills students are learning in Bridges. For example, students can take their book that's online and they can actually annotate it. And that's what makes the digital book um, interactive. Um, teachers are able to track progress of students as they're reading books. And so here it goes through a lot of it. So if we look, um, grades three through five is very similar to grades one through um, the first and second grade. Um, they have the digital um, tools where they can do things like the annotations, their two topics that they're interested in, and it helps them build vocabulary around that topic that they are studying. The report that the teachers receive, um, it gives the teacher information on the number of books that students have opened, the number of books that the students have completely read, the number of pages that the students have read, the, um, and also things like reading habits, such as are students opening the book in the morning, in the evening, on weekends, during the school day. So then it helps um, the teacher understand more of the reading habits. The other parts of it is that the teachers can get reports where they can build lessons, whether it's in small group or whole group class lessons based on the information that they're receiving on MyOn. So last year, we um, piloted MyOn in two schools, and we used it within the library and also in the classroom. And the librarians, the library media tech, this was one of the things that they really pushed for was having digital access for our students. And the digital access is 24 seven, and it's available both online and offline, so the students never lose access to the book. And so um, with the survey we sent out, we asked if they wanted to continue the MyOn for the following school year, and we had 95.7% said, yes, please, let's do continue. Some of the surveys, so some of the, we asked them, like, what do you like best about it? Uh, one of the respondents said, I would incorporate it into research projects as a source of information, as well as into homework assignments. It could also be a listening station in the benchmark station, um, so they can integrate it with our benchmark adoption. The second thing, um, or another um, quote from one of the respondents, oh my gosh, I use it during AR reading time. Students use it after school to read as well. It can be used as a reference material to supplement topic. It can be used for research and reports. The more I learn about my on, the more I like it, prioritize it over other online book resources. I'm not the one, I am not one to want a bunch of new adoptions for the sake of having them. This is definitely worth adopting and financing. Love it, love it, love it. And so we want to do a couple quick things. And with that, that's a quick preview of the MyOn, so it is um, a digital library access for our students that is aligned with already with what the programs that we use, the Accelerated Reader and the Star Set. And so with that, staff is asking for the approval of the purchase of MyOn for the 2021-22 school year. Thank you. Do we have any public speakers? No public speakers. Do we have any discussion from the board? I'd like to make a motion for purchase and use online we have a platform. First, a second. And a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And we will move on to item 9.5, 2021-22, uh, so zone to grow goal setting and reflection platform. It's still you. Anyway. Thank you, President Home Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez. On May 12, 2021, I brought to you the Zone to Grow um, platform to use with our summer session number two. And uh, tonight, I'm just going to give a little update um, and then ask for the implementation for the upcoming school year. So when I, went, when I was here um, May 12, I went through the platform and the different functionalities and the uses of it where students do an SEL check-in and they have little social emotional learnings. And so what we found out right now for um, this summer session, um, when I first did the presentation, uh, I was trying to hold off to get as many numbers as up-to-date numbers as possible. Last Friday, we had 1,136 students in grades through three through nine in our summer session number two um, that are active. The number on the bottom represents the update yesterday, which was 1,195. 
And as of today, we're up to 1,209. So with each day, there were some teachers that were, they were getting a little more comfortable letting their colleagues do it before they were implementing it. Um, active teachers, 59, we're up to 60. We've had um, the most current number for today is 4,936 student reflections. That means students have written 4,936 different reasons of uh, different things as such as, I am happy today was a great day. I passed a test. I am sad because um, the, my, the, my turtle didn't do something. Just various, various reasons from um, more alarming things that are like, I'm really sad because somebody in my family passed away or I'm very happy because, and so they're all over the place. Um, we've had at, up to date today, so that number 496 was from last Friday. As of today, 1,166 individual reflections given back to students from teachers. So what the students are writing, teachers are also able to give reflections back and the students are feeling. So the um, last time there was a question about the letter, whether we, um, we send out a letter to parents. This is the letter that is sent to parents. It's both in Spanish and English. It explains the program, and this was sent home with all of our students who are using the program. And it talks about they're going to do a daily reflection that asks about their feelings and that they will learn some social-emotional competencies. Um, this, once again, is the dashboard that, um, if we look at it, what, what we see the, on the left is the, the condensed and the um, little phone icon. It's students put in there, how are you feeling today? They click on a, a face. This is just kind of a reminder of what happens. And then it, tell me how your week went well, or how your week went, what went well, what are you gonna try next week? And that's where the students write the reflection. And then it comes into a dashboard on the bottom. This is sample data, this is not real data because we don't want for the privacy of our own students. Um, what we do see though, is that in the left-hand side, that is real data from last Friday, our students were at 3.9, which is in the happy range, the blue. So that is from um, actual summer school data. And then on the right, um, the bar graph, the line graph, you can see that was from last year for, the, for all of our students and then where they are now. The last dot was 3.99, which was from last week on overall average of the students. The bottom, it would comes up when um, an admin or a counselor sees the view. The most alarming things come up first and they're on the top. So you can see it goes from very sad to sad to okay. And so those, that's the view that counselors and admins see. There is an alert system. And from last Friday, we already had five alerts. These are ones that are more serious that need immediate attention. So we um, are alerted for it and then we automatically immediately um, engage with the family to make sure that we take care of it. First, we read it, see what's going on, and then we alert it. And that alert is set up to, you can actually control that to who sees the alert, just like you can control of who sees the student reflection, whether it is just the teacher and the admin or who has access. Some of the voices from this summer, this is secondary. Um, a student put, I really liked expressing how I felt and it feel and feel like someone is listening is great for mental and emotional health. Um, a middle school teacher, the student reflections provide space for a deeper conversation where we are more connected and a quicker connection allows me to initiate and guide classroom conversations based on what students have written. So the teacher looking at what the students write kind of get a sense for how the classroom is doing and can base different um, conversations on that without the students openly talking about how they feel. Elementary, um, we have two students and then we have a principal and a teacher. Um, one of the students said, I feel good about Sewn to Grow because of the faces we get to use. I want to use it during summer break and next year when the school co year comes. Um, uh, elementary principal said, Sewn to Grow offers dynamic SEL. There are not only opportunities for students to become reflective learners, but aids the teachers and admin to identify and address needs with and for individuals or whole class. And so this is um, from our elementary voices here. And with that, um, thank you very much for listening. We've had great implementation and um, I'm at, we're, staff is asking for the approval of the purchase of Stone to Grow for the 2021-22 school year so that we can um, monitor the social and emotional health of our students. Thank you.
Do we have any public speakers this item? No public speakers, President Holm. Do we have any discussion from the board? I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve. A second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. All right. Moving on to item 9.6, approved program facilities and services agreement between PVUSD and Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance, PVPSA, 2021-22. Uh, report will be presented by Kristen Schaus, Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. We will keep the social emotional supports rolling this evening with the contract in front of you for PVPSA. They have been a longstanding partner with us during COVID pandemic. We're able to pivot a lot of the supports that they are offering to our students, continuing even to the level of being able to do our home visits and the outreach pieces that we were greatly missing. In front of you, you'll see a contract for three licensed crisis support therapists, as well as two therapists in any payer system, which has been really integral in getting the needs of our, our folks met without Medi-Cal need. So what that means is any kid in the district, any family in the district can still obtain services through PVPSA, regardless of their insurance level. In addition, you'll see attached to it the tobacco use grant, which allows for a pass through to happen for them to continue to do our tobacco prevention support and classes for our students in regards to reducing tobacco use. You'll also see a pass through, which they took the lead on a grant with in combination with PVUSD to supply supports through playgroups and first five, which is also attached to the contract. And with that, staff recommends support of that in alignment with the May 26 approval at the board meeting for our extended learning opportunities grant. There is no impact to general fund. Thank you. Public speakers? No public speakers present home. Any discussion from the board? I'd like to make a motion to approve. I'll second. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. All right, item 9.7, agreement between Pajaro Valley Unified School District and the Latino Film Institute uh, Youth Cinema Project. The report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, superintendent. Yeah, thank you very much. So as you know, um, we, for the last three years, have been partnering with the Latino Youth Film Institute in order to continue to provide enrichment to our students. Um, we had this program evaluated by Stanford Scale Project, and it found to have um, significantly high impact on those students. Um, we're lucky to continue to be able to um, fund that partnership. You'll notice that the last several um, contracts, this contract and the next contract are all funded out of our Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant. So we're definitely being thoughtful and leveraging that money well. Um, this program will continue to fund the, the schools that is, it's currently at. So it currently is at fourth and fifth grade at Starlight Elementary, sixth, seventh, and eighth at Cesar Chavez Middle School, a first course and a second course at PV High, and at PMS, so Pajaro Middle School. Um, what this contract will do is it will extend it to two additional schools. So we will now have it at Hall District, so there will be a pathway um, on the, the south zone, so from a Pajaro school to a Pajaro middle school to PVHS. And then we're also going to be doing some after school classes um, with Virtual Academy. Virtual Academy with the changes to independent study, you now are required to have synchronous learning time. And so they will be providing synchronous learning time um, to students throughout um, the Virtual Academy. And so I encourage you to um, support this effort um, it not only will not uh, affect um, the general fund, it will support general. Thank you. No public speakers. Any discussion from the board? Um, how did we select? So the schools was it, well, the schools originally, it was based on um, principals who wanted the program. Um, and so the, that is how it went to Starlight and then Cesar Chavez. And then PMS was 
because of the pathway. So that's where those students go because we're trying to create K-12 um, CTE pathways alignment. Um, PMS was because um, Chris Harris was, was vocal and wanted it at his school. Um, and so we were able to do it with the discount that we gave, that they gave us. We were able to do it for free. So if you look at the um, the budget, what you'll see is they're constantly discounting us um, because we're a good partner. Um, so we were able to do that. What we noticed is that we didn't have the elementary version of that. So that's how we chose Hall District. We had to choose between Hall District and Ohlone. We chose Hall just because they're a project-based school and have been for several years, so it makes sense. And then Virtual Academy, it was an extension of AB, um, of the new um, a bill, assembly bill that came out, which required synchronous learning for students. And so we needed to add on additional enrichment in order to fulfill those new requirements. Uh, the reason why I'm asking is that the question I asked, why is it I think why it will be helpful in this thing, committee to consider to bring back what initiatives uh, that uh, that we're Do we have any other discussion? But first, do I have a second? Second. I just like to thank the foundation is it Edward for bringing this to our district. It's been an, a game changer for so many kids, and it's so much fun, and it really engages them. And the work that's coming out of this initiative is beautiful. So thank you, the foundation, for funding this and these vulnerable. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. Uh, item 9.8, our agreement between Pajaro Valley Unified School District and Life Lab. The report will be presented by Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, so um, we have had, we had a presentation um, a while back from with Life Lab, um, so you were able to hear the great work. Um, I do have Don and Hudi here um, because they can answer specific questions, but I'll just kind of stage it and then I'll ask you to come up to kind of speak to the expansion. So, um, as you all know, when we did the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant, one of the things that we heard when we listened to parents and staff was that they wanted to have ex extended opportunities for a couple of things. One, enrichment from our current partners and also outdoor learning. And um, we have been having Saturday and Thursday tours of um, Starlight. And we've been fortunate to have Don and, and Hudi there every time to really speak to the program. And I think what we've learned is that we are finally aligning our district vision with really our community's vision for where we should be. Um, and so one thing that we heard loud and clear was, we wish we could have this at each and every school site. So why can't we? So together, we are putting together a plan to make that happen. Um, and again, leveraging expanded learning opportunities grant uh, money so that we don't wind up affecting the general fund. Um, and so I know that there were some specific questions about the conversion. And so Don and Hudi, if you can come up and just speak to um, some of the changes and why those changes were selected. Buenas noches, good evening. Uh, President Holmes, Dr. Rodriguez, trustees, uh, thank you for inviting us to partner and strengthen this partnership. Um, it is many years in the making. Um, you might all know that Life Life has been around 42 years. And during that time, um, we've had many different opportunities to collaborate. From a lasers program back in the 90s, uh, which was language acquisition for science education in rural schools, to our most uh, current partnership, which is really working with the schools in what is both um, next generation science in the garden and kids book program. And we are 
super excited that we could actually bring this uh, opportunity to all the students. So over the last uh, several years, we've grown to partner with seven schools in the district. And previously, we were working with AmeriCorps fellows. In fact, you all helped us to double our number of AmeriCorps fellows. What we know and people around the country know that in order to continue to support a integrated garden-based learning program that includes both the learning science, that includes the nutrition piece, which we partner really strongly with um, food and nutrition services here at PVUSD, and to also have the environmental connection for the students to be able to have that, to really develop that space and the partnership with teachers and, and the entire district. It's going to require some um, staff that, we'll, that we can continue to work with year after year rather than having to rotate with AmeriCorps Fellows um, every year. And so this opportunity is allowing us to really um, envision a robust program that will be at all of the schools. And in addition to that, to be able um, to work with the, the science um, metric with the social emotional um, metrics as well. In fact, we want to read to you a beautiful letter that we received um, from a, a student this last week. And they gave us permission because originally this um, letter was written to the garden. And our uh, instructor, who uh, is Lila Simpson, she's one of our AmeriCorps fellows, said, I need to first ask the student if I have the permission to share it. Um, so she has the permission, and the <clears throat> note says, Hi, Garden. I love to be here when I am mad or sad. And to see you makes me good. The students are connecting with the space, and we have an opportunity to have the space available now also during recess, and the expanded staffing will allow us again to be, able to be fully integrated into the school and into the community. So thank you. Because... Uh, good evening, President Holm, trustees, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you so much for having us here and for this your leadership work. We have the privilege of working nationally with our time field, with the other work that we do beyond current. And as many of you know, bringing bringing what we learned there to bear on how we built the program with you all, and also sharing out uh, the models, materials, curriculum I love here. And we're very excited to uh, take on this, this new upgraded call with you and with all of your sites, and to study it to share that out broader move field in support of other districts where it fits their needs well. Um, just want to note, I think there was a particular question about the, the big shift, and this has been a, a really open up for us, for our um, from with you all and with uh, the staff trying to get through this year, to then have this opportunity to engage this conversation. And it really uh, created a new dialogue for our around the possibility. So we had been uh, starting with AmeriCorps as a way to scale opportunities with food. But we've gone through four different AmeriCorps. So the, the, the move to permanent or longer term staff um, has a lot of obvious at the site level students or the teachers families have continuity here to here, um, but it also just uh, is more functional. It, it is hard to have these these great relationships with students, um, with their their garden and for one or two years while they're still going through their years. We love their energy as they bring, but we are very excited to get this staff model where invest long term not retaining it but improve uh, practices uh, thoughtful so um, we're excited about this and 
also the, the shift is um, really to having an educator and instructor at site, which will allow us to go beyond the K2 levels where we do garden on up into five GSS based green units already available to pilot build out. So uh, it really upgrades what we can direct also with you know, develop people to be there and open have these miniature parks full sites available to students all day. and then ideally um, where it works site to families out we're, we're excited thank you do we have any public speakers this item no public speakers do we have any discussion from the board uh, Me again, Daniel Dodd Jr. Thank you for always answering my emails. Mini White has a great plot of, plot of land. They have a garden. I, I hope you could bring what you guys do to other schools. McQuitty, beautiful garden. Um, Calabasas, too. Are you guys at Calabasas? He, we aren't currently a core partner. They're not a partner oh. in our current program, but they, they do have a robust. Uh, yes, and great Calabasas has connection. a garden. I know yeah. all has a garden, and yeah. it'd be nice if you guys come to Mini White. And we have been involved in Calabasas this summer. Yeah. My... So, that's amazing. Uh, you know, the K through 5 pool, that, that letter that you got, I mean, just that, you know, when, when I was there, I mean, just that little garden could be a park, like that. You know, you could get lost and look for ladybugs, bugs, and it just kind of takes your mind away from whatever it can be. So I, I'd also like to make a motion to support your agenda. I think. I'd like to second that comment. Um, Pre-COVID, Judge Jr. and I were at the event of and Dr. Vegas, such a level. And of course, last year, hopefully we get back to something of that this school year. That would be wonderful. Um, could you cite Chris? Um, not for all the board public how many of our for PBUS yes. specific we are currently at seven schools at seven mm -hmm. and uh so it, we're at a messy and soldo starlight Hall district mcquitty ohlone and HA. and i do have to say that starlight is is particularly i think a north star for what we can all envision is possible in a community and so I think the other beautiful thing about this, this partnership is that we are also um, having opportunities to the bridges between the students and the family and to really uh, be able to value the, the, the work that is done and to recognize that, um, you know, feeding the world is perhaps one of the most important things and that this community both contributes to and that children now can begin to have more conversations and even learn from, from parents so that school uh, home become part of that greater uh, community. Well, and you, you said that well about feeding the world. This, and recognizing the very realistic challenges with that, that being expressed is real the age work parents that agree with if oh thank you here for the work I thank you. Mine's just more of a clarifying question, um, because it was a little unclear going through the report. Are these going to be PVUSD teachers, or are these going to be teachers mm -hmm. from that life lab? They, they are life lab instructors, so they go through their protocols and their curricula. Okay, because I know right now the gardens at Starlight, H.A. Hyde, um, Watsville Charter School of the Arts, and Cesar Chavez, which you are at two of, that extended learning maintains those gardens. Um, there are is extended learning going to be still maintaining those gardens. What's going on with that aspect? Of it? That's 
uh, we we definitely look forward to continued close partnership with extended learning around the garden program. And um, in fact, uh, we're very close to a, a state grant that will uh, fund, I believe it was 1,600 hours of extended learning position Starlight to accomplish what we're going to be doing today with that. So, uh, but um, we are uh, really excited about a number of different elements of this event. And one of them is allow us to provide more care along to relieve them a little bit. They've been really working over both starting garden rehabbing um, but then also maintaining them, especially through critical times, again, through our, our cycles with AmeriCorps, we have downtime for a month and a half summer, right? And there's a need for a lot of care. And so um, our folks would be leaving, but it would be on a morning to do that. So we're excited that this new model allows us also to be good partners all the way through and to help really these like starting classrooms. So right now you're, it's still extended learning, but you will be working alongside extended learning at those sites. Very much. Okay. And then what's happening with our other partner sites? Um, are we planning on trying to get LifeSab in there? I know like Calabasas, as UCSC, Rolling Hills, um, as Community Bridges. Well, I think that's why we're we're gonna, as we've done with other things, we'll start with schools that don't necessarily have a partnership. And then what we generally do is we fold them in and, and Don can speak to, but he actually is already an active partner of UCSD. So like, for example, the partnership with Calabasas, I think will be seamless because they already have the partnership established with UCSD. What we found through our Greater Pajaro Valley um, Talent Compact is all of our partners are extremely willing to work together and we see the synergy of working together. So it hasn't been really necessarily, this is what we, this is what I do, don't engage with me, but rather we have seen there's so much need that it's really just a transformative like shift that we wind up finding where we can just serve more children more time versus worrying necessarily which partner is doing which but if you want to speak more to you, yes, we're, we've been uh, really um, excited about the new opportunity, the education part there, and so, and work care as well as being in And we look forward to deeper part in touch with the that's involved in all of We're very happy. To before, even before we bring our able to call that part of school, and then certain. The other thing I want to say, uh, thinking about that array of partnerships, we've also been really excited to invite other partners to consider ways to use space. So, Erica from CBPSA, of course, spoke up immediately, which is great for all the reasons that. So we look forward to the, the integration. No, I am definitely a proponent of getting gardens at all of our, our sites, and we all know the psychological benefits of children getting their hands into the dirt and what it can do for the mind and spirit. Um, so I just wanted to address those concerns. My only other concern is that, um, you know, that we're not cycling through a bunch of instructors um, because kids need continuity. And we do want to build, like you mentioned, that relationship with the children at the site. And I think it's also important to have people look at um, opportunities to hire people from the community that know yeah. our community, that work from our community. I know there's been previous concerns of um, you had students working and people working that they didn't want to drive through to Watsonville. So just taking those things to consideration that it's the right fit for the school site and the right fit for the children. After all, the, the children are the ones who are going to suffer if they're constantly recycling when those are who are going to benefit the most. So 
absolutely agree with all of that. That that is another reason that we're we're really interested in moving away from the model of for as well because we've seen now we've had enough years to see the impact of different uh, uh, economic cycles. So last year we were able to recruit this group of fellows because jobs are there. This year, as the economy comes back, harder. Well, that tends to then equity issues. There are already equity issues. The opportunity that AirCorp is a beautiful program in many ways, but it's from an equity. That's just by don't already live. Even even wonderful educators have who live here and live at home and save housing costs are worth. So that's a, a big part of it, that it's America, the American model generally has really very much finding those possibilities. And this last question is just more of an update question. So I know we had state structures on our list of things. We talked about that previous. What's the status? I, we actually will have the update for you in the Friday, oh. but um, what you will find is that we already have um, many of the sites already have the slabs laid. Um, and so, and we even have the posts up for some. Um, as was mentioned previously, it was just last week. It feels like a lot longer than that, <laughs> but it was just last week that Ryan mentioned um, we are still having. Um, materials issues, right? So whether it's the steel or the wood, um, so we are doing everything that we, that they can with the materials that they have. Um, and um, we have seen progress already this past week, um, but you will see on Friday, you'll see the official update. And thank, thank you for you. coming. By moving in. Big. Um, really exciting. I'd like to touch on the, uh, the therapy aspect. I'm an avid gardener myself, nowhere near an expert novice. I try. Um, I, I admire driving by all the sites and seeing all the gardens. <clears throat> they give me ideas. They inspire me in different ways. The same thing, you know, I work in the city of Santa Cruz, and there's a lot of community gardens. <clears throat> there's the Homeless Garden Project um, at the Long Marine Lab. That's, that's a huge project. You know, the, the purpose and is great. So, um, yeah, it's good to see that the children, you know, they're, they're learning, you know, not only, uh, you know, the agriculture part of it, but it's also the, the nurturing of the plant, taking it from a seed to the finished product. You know, I'm waiting on about 20 pounds of nectarine stuff at home. So I know that feeling that, you know, I'm, I'm bringing stuff in the house all the time. My wife, what do you got now? And cucumber. So, you know, fresh food, you know, makes a big difference. Thank you. I'd love to see this program expand even further. Did we have a motion yet? We, we have a motion, uh, first and second. Did you have a comment? No, just it's great. I think one of the first Life, life, life Lab sites was at Valencia Elementary, and they we still have a beautiful, thriving garden there. Anyway, great. We'd like to see you guys come up. And so we have a lot there that need opportunities. And thank you. you I, I was going to ask about the transition from AmeriCorps and you uh, for, uh, presentation, so I appreciate that. Why? But the continuity totally, totally makes sense. And I just want to say, you know, also just from a health perspective, you know, as a nurse, it's like, you know, introducing kids, giving them an opportunity to have these fresh foods, vegetables, fruits they've participated in, 
is tremendous. Like I, I got to do a site visit. One of the, one of the this cool boy. It's like licking his kid. I like kale. And then he's like, afterwards they put together the salad chow- down, and he's like, I never thought I'd eat kale. <laughs> bite after bite after bite after bite. You know, and he's like, that was good. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so, um, in, in you know full enthusiasm. So thank you. So we have a first and a second. Uh, ah, yes. So uh, Trustee Dodge Jr. made the motion, and Trustee Acosta seconded. And um, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. All right. So item 9.9, uh, California School Employees Association Chapter 132 Sunshine proposal for the 2020-2021 school year to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Brian Saxon. All right, I'm back. Um, good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, first, I want to point out again that there is a typo in this. That word to should be changed to from. And then uh, this item was previously discussed in the public hearing just a little while ago. And it is recommended that the Board of Trustees accepts uh, the Sunshine proposal from PVUSD to CSEA for the 2021 school year, of the 2021 school year, for the following article from the master contract, Article 12, entitled Vacation. So, thank you. Do we have any public speakers to this item? No public speakers. Do we have any discussion from the board? Almost. I've got a motion. Uh, second from Soto. Uh, with that, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. All right. So 9.10, approved job description and salary schedule, coordinator child development and coordinator teen parent program. Friends. All right. So good evening again, President Holm, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, as you may or may not know, Lisa Sandoval has moved into Kathy Lathrop's position as the Director of Early Childhood Education after Kathy retired, after serving the district for so many years. Uh, this has allowed us to have some fresh eyes on the coordinator position that Lisa vacated, as well as another position that was vacated by another um, staff member. In doing this, we reviewed the work that was being done by the Child and Development Coordinator and the Teen Parent Program Coordinator and realigned the salary schedules and workloads to more accurately meet the needs of the Child Development Program. Please note that we are not adding or subtracting any management positions. We have three coordinator positions and will continue to have those same three positions. Additionally, the one staff member currently in their position will not be taking a reduction in pay. We have reduced the teen parent program coordinator position to a range 20 and increased the child and development coordinator positions, which there are two, to a range 30. These changes have now put the salary and duties in alignment. Uh, this change is cost neutral to the district as the reduction of the one allowed for an increase to the other two positions. Uh, we respectfully ask for your approval of the job description and salary schedule as presented. Do we have any public? No public. Any discussion from the board? Mr. Hi, Brian. Hi. Can you explain why Nader is range 20? Why was that? Um, the the workload is commensurate with a with the range 20 on our management scale versus the child and development coordinators that are working with the a broader range of locations, people, and assignments, whereas the team program is solely based in one location. Oh. Um, oh, no, he's right there. Do you remember what it was? 27? It was 27. Was yeah. Okay, so I would argue that that's a very complex program. You're dealing with have all kinds of health issues. Issues with their boyfriend, domestic, et cetera. I see it seems like maybe even a more complex position, but I don't understand. 
what I'll do is I'll ask Lisa to come speak to that since she was in that position and she's going to be overseeing the position. So Lisa's going to come forward Perfect. to speak to um, the change and why she feels that it can be successful for her program. So good evening, Ms. Hall. Good evening, President Hall, Dr. Rodriguez and trustees. To answer your question, the team parent coordinator is the position I actually held for 16 years. And it originally was at a range 20. And then I took on additional duties overseeing multiple sites. So it was moved to a range 27. And with redistributing that work according to the way after I had been doing it and the other coordinators, it actually it is fitting to make that more of just team parent focus and supporting the team parents in our district. Yes, I just worry that we won't find like a super competent, excellent employee at that salary range that's so much lower now. Um, and what credentials I'm, are you looking for for that particular position? So that position can have a teaching credential, an administrative credential as I do, um, or it could have a child development teacher permit. Mm -hmm. And that would be acceptable. And um, even with the lower range, I believe that we would be able to fill that position. Further comment? Entertain a motion. Approved. I'll second. With the, I've got a first and a second. Off of foot. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Thank you. Uh, item 9.11, agreement between the County of Santa Cruz and the Pajaro Valley Unified School District. Report will be presented by Clint. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Before you tonight, we have an agreement with the County of Santa Cruz to do some work actually at one of our, near one of our schools, Rio Del Mar Elementary. Um, it's actually, stated in highway codes and California street codes that the public who owns the property shall maintain the um, adjacent um, sidewalk directly in front of that property. So if, for those of you who are familiar with Rio, there's a very small sidewalk leading to our school that is not the safest for students. For a long time, the county has been trying to gather enough money to be able to do this project. However, again, the actual sidewalk piece is our responsibility. Um, through collaboration and a partnership with the county, we've actually found a way to kind of complete two projects in one, which is um, both extending that sidewalk for our students to provide a safer path to schools, as well as kind of fix the road and the crosswalk that, again, for those of you familiar, doesn't really lead directly to another sidewalk. Um, they're not ADA, ADA compliant sidewalk. They don't have the actual bumpers to go down. So there's a lot of problems with that section, especially at Pinehurst right there. Um, so we have been in works with the county to provide $100,000 towards this project or 50% of the project, whichever is less, because originally they asked us, they thought they would need about 100,000. I did wanna ensure that we are paying our half of the project, not anymore. Um, the county has been very cooperative in showing us the plans and working with us. The great thing about this is by coming into this agreement, we're able to kind of piggyback onto the work they're already doing. So they're already gonna be tearing up part of that street and kind of repairing it. Um, we've also worked with the county with Steve Weisner to talk about the fact that we need to ensure that students have a safe path to school even while construction is going on, as well as ensure that our bus transportation, as well as parent drop-off is unaffected by the um, construction. So they are working with that site to ensure that they look at the time of day when they can do construction and when they have to stop construction. So um, at this point, staff would recommend that we approve the agreement with the County of Santa Cruz to provide $100,000 towards this improvement for our students. Thank you. Do we have any uh, public speakers? No public speakers. I'm going to speak first on this one because it's like this. I, I, you know, having been a Rio parent for 17 years with, you know, the age span of my kids and, and having to navigate that walkway, this, I am so delighted. <laughs> it's like, this is, this is such, and this is just such a wonderful opportunity to collaborate with the county in the work we're already doing. Um, it's so I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to make the motion that we approve this item. But uh, 
I'd love to hear other discussions on the board. Great, I'll second. Great, thank you. I have a first in this. I made it first and got a second. I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. All right. So item 9.12, our, our use agreement uh, between the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and the Community Agroecology Network Fiscal Agent of Gerest Mill Cap. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I have here before you an agreement that back in 2015, we actually began working with um, Mesa Gar Verde Gardens to construct community gardens at three of our sites. We continue, have continued to do that work through 2020. Um, now we are approaching, um, now we're in 2021, we'd like to extend that uh, agreement with them for another three years till 2024. Um, this is providing great support to our communities, providing over 80 families utilize these community gardens. Um, they do utilize an undeveloped property that the district is currently not using. And rather than me speak too much about it, I would actually like to invite some of the individuals who actually work with the farms up to speak about their experiences and the importance of these community gardens. So, Hugo, if you wouldn't mind. Good evening, I'm a counselor quiero para platicarles un poquito de las experiencias que tengo para para poder cultivar a las tierras milperas. Uh, cómo sembrar ¿verdad? a toda clase de semillas, cómo podemos ¿verdad? cultivar, mover la tierra y cómo podemos sembrarla. Uh, eh, platicar un poquito de las experiencias de mis abuelos que me enseñaron a trabajar las tierras desde Desde cuando tenía como ocho años, pues mis padres me enseñaron también, ¿verdad? Cómo trabajar la tierra con bueyes, con caballos, y cómo mover la tierra para tener una cosecha mejor. I was taught how to use hog, hog, for the land step. Uh, para cosechar la, la cosecha sin químicos. To Uh, se necesita pues de que nosotros a veces toda la rastrojo que está lo sacamos para afuera y, y eso es muy importante que todo el rastrojo que está se recoja en un solo puesto, se haga un lugar donde se puede enterrar y ya cuando se va a sembrar se saque y este es el abono que se saca para, para ponerle la planta. El, uh, el, very important for us to compost to work it so that when we are ready to use it, we can make that we use it um, in, in the soil and get much better uh, crop. Sí, es muy importante de que nosotros cuando vamos a trabajar nuestras tierras, de que tengamos uh, el espacio y toda la hierbita que se echa, muchas personas la sacan para afuera y eso no, no hay que sacarlo. Eso se entierra en el mismo lugarcito para que poner una plantita allí y eso es lo que vamos a, a, a comer cosas orgánicas. Very important that we follow our uh, 
Ah, pues esto es lo que, lo que estamos haciendo por ahorita en la Sierra Milperas. Estamos, ya tenemos la cosecha de, del maíz, ya está el elote, el tomate, el chile. Right now in the garden, corn, calabaza, pumpkin, mucho, chile. Eso es lo que, las experiencias que me dieron mis padres, mis abuelos, y eso es lo que estoy compartiendo con los jóvenes, ¿verdad? Porque ellos necesitan, porque ellos son, pues, ¿verdad? Lo que después de nosotros, ellos vienen esta nueva generación. That is the experience that my parents had. I'm very eh, Y esta, esta juventud, pues, necesita de, de compartir con ellos las experiencias que nosotros tenemos para sembrar la semilla. It's very important that we share with our, our experience. Sí, pues de que estas son mis experiencias y que pues estén buenas noches. These are my experiences. I wish you all. Thank you. Gracias, señor. Pues eh, primero que nada quisiéramos eh, agradecerles por su apoyo y soporte eh, durante todos estos años. I want to thank you for your support about these many years. Eh, y como ven, pues venimos de una comunidad muy variada, eh, que pues eh, para nosotros incluso el inglés, la lengua, se nos dificulta un poco. We are from a very diverse background. Uh, in, uh, as a matter of fact, English is a very diverse language. Y como pueden ver, pues eh, venimos de muchísimas generaciones de sembrar, eh, pues de esta manera, eh, la milpa. Eh, miles y miles de años. We, have, uh, we come with many, through many generations of uh, how to harvest uh, corn. For thousands and thousands of okay. years. Thousands, thousands of years. <laughs> It's extremely important. <laughs> sí, exacto. Y, y bueno, y, y pues quizá esto no se comprende porque pues estamos normalizando día a día el sistema eh, que pues eh, ahorita decimos 2021 después de Cristo. This may not be understood because right now we are we are really uh, normalizing this the system that now we actually say um, 2021 um, after Christ. Entonces eh, cuando eh, vemos a estas eh, antiguas generaciones enseñándonos eh, cómo se vivía y se vive actualmente en los eh, en el sur global. So when we see old generations teaching us how how they used to live in the in this world. The global South eh, eh, for also thousands of years. And, <laughs> exactly. And also eh, that um, they still live like in that way. Eh, entonces eh, como que no se comprende eh, esto que menciona Catarino, ¿no? Estamos eh, sembrando de manera natural eh, y sin ningún químico en una zona industrial, ¿no? Que produce billones y billones de dólares. It's kind of difficult to understand that we are um, harvesting in this area, in this very organic area, uh, part, and we are acting in an area that uh, yields uh, billions of dollars. Entonces estamos trabajando desde hace 10 años con un grupo de gente que ha sido desplazada desde hace más de 500 años. We have been working these last few years uh, with a group of people who have been displaced for over uh, one, two, over 500 years. Entonces, eh, pues eh, como pueden observar, tenemos algunos eh, retos todavía por superar. Currently we have some challenges yet to, uh, to face. Pero creemos que lo más importante, pues naturalmente es nuestra comunidad, que nunca ha sido escuchada. But we believe that the most important thing is our community who has really never been heard. 
Entonces, ahora que eh, nos liberamos de la industria eh, de las non-profits, del complejo industrial de las non-profits, Now that we are free from the uh, non-profit, uh, from the businesses um, for profit. From the non-profit non -profit industrial complex. Eh, estamos eh, intentando eh, pues, hacer todo lo, todo lo que la comunidad siempre ha querido. We are trying to accomplish everything that the community has uh, ever wanted. Eh, y debido a eso, pues, eh, también sabiendo que eh, hemos colaborado con ustedes durante tantos años, eh, nos gustaría también eh, que pudieran apoyarnos para, pues, continuar, como ven ustedes, con esta tarea tan importante. Having worked with you so many years before, we would really appreciate if you could continue your support so that we could continue to do this good work. Como ven, es una comunidad increíblemente responsable. ¿no? Eh, nuestra eh, gran mayoría de la membresía eh, piscan fresas y moras y manzana. You can see this is a very responsible community. Uh, the majority of our members uh, actually work in the very field. Y eh, también, pues, algunos tienen que vivir en, en diferentes lugares, como Salinas. Some of our members also have to live uh, in other areas, like Salinas. Entonces, es una, de nuevo, una comunidad que es, ha sido constantemente desplazada por la gentrificación. Again, this is one, a community has been always uh, uh, dis <laughs> displaced because of gentrification. Entonces, pues de nuevo, ¿no? O sea, nosotros eh, sabemos eh, lo, lo, quizá lo, lo complejo que es eh, tomar decisiones. Sin embargo, creemos que debido a que contamos con también la experiencia laboral que produce estos billones de dólares en la industria agrícola. So we know that we are also counting with the experience of the commun uh, agricultural community. Eh, entonces, eh, pues, eh, quisiéramos su apoyo para eh, llevar a cabo ciertos proyectos que esa comunidad, pues, nunca ha podido eh, realizar por estar eh, dependiendo de este eh, non-profit industrial complex. We would like your support to continue with these projects that we have not been able to fulfill because we have been under the um, non-profit industry. Entonces, de nuevo, pues muchísimas gracias por su apoyo y esperamos pues su resolución eh, muy atentamente. ¿no? Thank you again for your support and we look forward to your um, <laughs> to your approval very soon. So again. Um... I would like staff would like to request the approval of the extension of this um, use agreement with um, the uh, Community Agroecology Network and their fiscal agent um, for TRS Milpiva. Uh, do we have any public speakers? No public speakers. Uh, Costa Costa? Yes, I I'd just like to help put these poor men out of their misery and make a motion <laughs> to approve this. Thank you. Um, and I I with that I just like to add a comment, um, you know, with respect to our community partners, community guests that are coming to speak to either action items or report discussion items on our agenda. Going forward in the future, I know the agenda is made to publish Friday before board day. But going forward, if we know that we have community members partners here, whether it's an action item or a report discussion item, if the board president or board member or cabinet member, staff member recognizes that here, maybe that could be brought mm -hmm. to the attention to the board president, the board before the approval of the agenda. So we can move that because our life lab partners had to sit here for nearly two hours before they consent. Wonderful gentleman sat here for two and a half hours. So, so I think respectfully, if we contact that of our. 
are one. Y les quiero agradecer por estar aquí por tarde y compartir sus experiencias. How many locations do we have? So we currently have three locations. Um, one is at Starlight, one is at Rolling Hills, and the other one is at Pajaro Middle. And the Starlight one kind of expands towards um, uh, Diamond Tech. I have a question for the gentleman in the back. Um, how many types of corn do you guys have back there? Quantos? Gracias por tu palabras. Um, I heard about this program. Uh, Danny, can you let um, Alisa just give it oh, to I'm translate sorry. for the benefit of the public? He said that there are many, um, many uh, of the members bring their own seeds from their own countries. For example, he brought some seeds from uh, El Salvador. And there's some uh, other seeds that they bring and, and to uh, work in, the, in those gardens. I heard about this program. Um, he was the migrant ed teacher at all school. I remember his name right off the bat, but he was telling me about this program. And he was telling me about the different types of corn, chiles, and all these countries and all these places from Central and South America, how they're allowed to plant. And he was telling me the story, so I wholeheartedly support the program. Thank you. Any other comments? Oh, it's funny. Vice President Stocker? So I just want to say I know that um, many of the families at Starlight um, depend on this garden as a source of food table. So for Hugo back there, mucho familias Starlight de and oh, Jardin. And I also want to say lo siento por hacer. So también gracias por trabajo. Lo siento mi español es pequeño, pero you know. Importante. Gracias. Yeah. All right. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. All right. Item. Um, uh, President Holm, may I interrupt? I'd like to make a motion to extend our meeting to midnight. All right. So we have a motion to extend the meeting till midnight. I'll second. First and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 6 1. So, item 9.13, Youth Through Survey Agreement 2021 24. Our report will be. Yeah, thank you very much. So, for the last three years, we have been engaging with Youth Through Survey. Each year, we've been successful in increasing the numbers. Um, so, last year, even during the pandemic, um, we had 18,676 responses um, between um, students, staff, and families. Um, we believe that it's something, um, one, it's anonymous, so it's really, that's really great for us. It also provides us longitudinal data so we can look over things that, um, across time. You'll actually see us use this data um, within our restorative start, um, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later this evening. Um, we want to continue that effort so that we have the long, um, longitudinal data. And so I request the um, the approval of this agenda. Yeah. Uh, do, any public speakers? Okay. Any discussion from the board? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion to support this agenda. A second. A first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, all those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 9.14, classroom supplies for certificated staff. Report will be presented by Dr. Michelle. Yeah. So two years ago, Trustee Orozco had asked um, 
for us to begin um, this special fund for teachers um, where we were able to um, provide $125 to all um, certificated staff. Um, what, what we're able to do with this is we're able to um, provide, um, I guess, Um, so how we're going to be doing is we'll be able to provide um, a purchase order um, for each teacher. Um, we're going to be able, teachers will be able to do it in multiple ways. They will be able to either do online orders, which will be delivered to the school site at the requester's attention, or they'll actually be able to go into Palace. The reason why we did this um, was because we wanted to make sure that we would be able to provide a funding source to teachers um, that was easier for them um, than having to go through like a department um, department um, budget or um, a school site budget. Um, and so we're, we have already trained and supported um, the purchasing department in order to be able to do this. Um, Palace last year was fantastic in ensuring cost control. So they made sure that teachers um, weren't able to go over their amount um, and also allowed, told us um, the teachers who didn't spend their amount last, the, two years ago um, at, with about a month left, we still had significant teachers not use the funding um, and we were able to re-engage them. And in the end, almost every teacher was able to do it. Tell us also is awesome because they provide us next day delivery because they're local. Um, and so we request um, that you support this effort. Great. Uh, so do we have any public speakers for this item? No public speakers. Any discussion from the board? I do. Um, but before we do that, I want to this. Um, so I'm just really happy that we're able to continue this moving Great. All these, uh, from the emails I received, they were very helpful for the um, to purchase their materials so that they don't have to uh, get money out of their own pocket. Um, so I'm in full support this item please continue second. Do you have any further comments? First and a second. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. All right. So item 10. Point, we're going to go on to our report and discussion items. Item 10.1, our 45-day revised budget update. Good evening, President Holm, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, as is required by Ag Code, no later than 45 days after the, the governor actually signs his finalized budget, we are required to provide a 45-day revision to our budget if there are material changes to the budget. So um, this isn't something you typically will always see. It depends on really what changes in that last signing of that um, kind of the blue income paper by the governor. So for this year, we did actually see some um, one major change that impacted our district from the governor's budget. So I just want to go through that briefly. So again, what is the 45-day revision? Um, this is an update for the Board of Trustees to see how the governor's final budget impacted our district. This is not any um, revenue changes or expenditure changes based on our assumptions. This is only changes that come from the governor's budget. So this isn't a correction to our budget based on something we didn't do. It's only new information that we're adding to the budget. And so what is it not? Again, it's not a new budget. This is not our brand new budget. It's only a change based on what was signed. And it is also um, not an update on our priorities or where we're spending our money. Again, just really looking at what changed due to that governor's budget. <clears throat> so what is new? So um, as you may remember from our July adopt, we talked, or I talked a lot about 
concentration funding and how it was currently actually in the Senate wanting to be switched to supplemental funding, which actually wouldn't have helped our district as much. Thankfully, Governor Newsom pushed back and did want to continue his support of those highly vulnerable students. So he pushed back and did say that there would be a 15% increase to concentration funding, which for us is about $5.64 million. So um, we also saw a slight reduction in unemployment uh, insurance. You won't see that in our 45-day revise as that number is not finalized, but we did hear that coming as well. So very briefly, how does our budget change? You'll see that the only change really is in our revenue. So we do not have those expenditures booked yet because it is new revenue. You will see at the bottom though, our ending fund balance, there is one major change and that's the assigned fund balance. So one of the tricky parts about um, this, this specific piece of budget that came from Governor Newsom is it's concentration funding, which is used really for our highly vulnerable students. And specifically with this information or with this money, Governor Newsom stated that you have to utilize it on your schools that have 55% or higher unduplicated count of students. And really that's what the concentration funding is. Again, concentration funding is dollars for those students above and beyond the 55% mark. So one of the reasons you'll see this is as assigned, this is not money we can spend on anything. We do have to target those specific schools. So we do know it'll be targeted for those schools. It's not something we can use to offset any other additional cost at this time because the CDE is gonna actually require us to identify how we supported those 55% and over schools. So while we did get 5.64 million in new dollars, which is great, it really needs to be focused on those students and spent to add above and beyond and to close that learning gap for those. So with that, that is the only really changes for our 45 day revise and I'm happy to take any questions. Again, because it's an update of the budget um, that the governor signed, this is not something we take action on, it's just an update for the board. Public speakers to this? New speakers present home. Any questions or comments from the board? Like me. We don't have to. We don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank, thank you, Clint. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to item 10.2, first reading of board policy 5123, promotion acceleration pension. Uh, will we presented by Dr. Schiller? Yeah, thank you. So you are going to see two additional, two first readings. So. Um, we'll have it put up for you in, in just a second. AB1, um, AB104 um, came into effect and it required us to make these changes um, prior to um, July of, um, of the 31st for this current school year. Um, and then we're making these changes in board policy for um, until it's changed, so for in perpetuity. Um, are you able to get that PDF up there or no? Okay, so that would be great so they can see the red line. So what you'll notice on both of these board policies is um, that it was just additions. So these, again, there isn't much leeway because what happened is education code changed. So this is AB, so Assembly Bill um, 104. And what it requires is what you see here in red. So it speaks to traditional kindergarten. So when this board policy was actually put together, transitional kindergarten wasn't even a um, thing yet. Um, and so it just does note that transitional kindergarten actually is a two-year instructional program. It's not meant actually for a child to go into TK and then go straight into first grade. Um, there is the ability um, in rare cases for students to accelerate to first grade, but it needs to be based on academic, behavioral, and social emotional competencies. Um, and then it also speaks to if a child does not attend transitional kindergarten in PBUSD, therefore we have not been able to observe that child, that child should be evaluated in a kinder classroom in our school district for at least the first two weeks on, before determining acceleration. Um, and then what you'll see is the changes that continue um, on. Um, so there was some that was struck out because it is actually old language. Um, and so you'll see um, the new language there and the progress that needs to be made. And then you'll see notice of the monitoring through our MPSS team. So um, Assistant Superintendent Clappenbach spoke to MPSS and, and the Student um, Success Team Improvement Plan 
um, a while back. Um, we did need to specifically talk about our English learners because we want to, we need to make sure that they are meeting criterion. And so it speaks to them ensuring that they can um, increase at least one of those levels a year or maintain the criterion um, in order to be able to meet those promotions. Um, and so as with all first readings, this isn't for action today, um, but um, what we did is we took the requirements of AB 104 and we implemented it in here. Um, so revisions um, can be slightly tweaked, um, but most of these revisions are required by AB 104. Um, and um, I'll take any questions and then I'll go to the next one. Any any questions or comments from the board? Um, so going back to the, can mm -hmm. come up for students, um, they didn't get a chance to enter, uh, uh, but they are above level. Um, allow uh, that first I would I would say because unless well it's all according to if they went to summer school um, because the whole key is we want to actually see them in person working within the classroom prior to accelerating them as a principal I have unfortunately seen children accelerated that it later on backfires on us in like fourth and fifth grade because they really didn't have the maturity level that we wanted them to have. And then they also didn't have the academic acceleration that we thought that they had. So if the child never showed up in person and we never saw that child, I would highly, I would, well actually in the next one we'll talk about parent notification um, and having to have a timeline on that, but I would suggest that we would view them in person for the two weeks prior to acceleration. I just wanted to clarify whether it was. Yeah, oh, and really? in the next one, we'll talk exactly to your point. Okay. All right, we'll move on to item 10.3, our first reading of board policy uh, 51 communication. So we'll put that up. So here you'll see the communication with parents. So this is a little bit addressing Christy Orozco's question about whether you, ha you have a parent who is feeling as if their child needs to either be retained or accelerated, and what do we do um, in that case? So one, we just updated the email and digital platforms because we now communicate with parents in those ways. And then if you scroll down, um, what you'll see is now what's required of us. So this is AB 104 of what's required of us. So when a parent requests um, to have a consultation, then we need to be able to do that. During that time, we're required to give them a discussion, discussion of all learning recovery options um, and also the courses, if they're high schoolers or middle schoolers, the courses that they received a D or F in and their forms of credit recovery or other support. Um, we do have to consider their academic data and other relevant data um, and retention, whether it's in their best interest, both academically and socially. Um, most, well, not as many people in this school district know, but my doctorate is actually on pupil retention. Um, and, and what we know is that the grand majority of students um, 90, 98 percent of students by 13 have lost all benefits of pupil retention, and so we have to, one thing that we're required to do, actually within this um, within this AB 104, is to tell the parents about that research. So we're we're required to tell them about those effects because a lot of people see the short term effects as being beneficial, but they don't realize the negative effects that generally kick in after the age of 13. Um, and then we're, we're required to tell them about the types of interventions. And then we have to make, um, if they're a special education student, we have to do it consistent with their um, individualized education plan. Um, and we must tell them the final determination within 10 days. So we have to meet with them within 30 days, 
and tell them the determination within 10 days of the consult. Um, and so again, this is our, our first reading of um, the parent communication. Any public questions or comments? Move on, hearing none, we'll move on to item 10.4, our restorative start uh, family engagement and wellness. And that will be by Dr. Rodriguez, uh, our superintendent of schools, and that's our superintendent of schools. Right, so we're going to go ahead and, and put, up, um, put up the PowerPoint so that you guys can um, See the, the great work that we're doing. I think um, this is whether it's because we had so many months of um, of distance learning, or just because we're super excited about um, about this this pre, about our restorative start. Um, I think the energy is really um, palpable, um, and we're so ready for um, for where we're we're going. So um, please, please don't. It, it, I had the. Um, can, um, we'll leave it. Um, this is what happens when you do Google Play. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the PDF is correct, but anyways. Um, so we um, this year, as you know, today was actually a fantastic day. I went home and changed midday um, because if you would have seen us earlier, we were all in um, mostly jeans and our brand new shirt that is denoting the PVUSD cares. Um, Alicia has it on, um, and we because we did a video today, so we did a video with um, with multiple departments, multiple staff members that we're going to share at the um, at the breakfast, focusing on PVUSD cares, whole child, whole family, whole community. So niño completo, familia completa, and comunidad completa. Um, and so we listen to the voices of our student, staff, families, and community partners. So something that we've been doing is having consistent input from our families. And what we know, and I had mentioned it at the last meeting, is that we are hearing the exact same thing every time. So we had 3,122 responses in May. We asked them about how they were not only feeling about returning to pre-COVID activities, where you can see that we have a large portion of students who are feeling extreme anxiety. Um, that would be the 14%. 15, I would count as also being high level of anxiety. And then you have that 27% that still has a fairly high level of anxiety. And then we ask them all the different things about how did COVID impact their health and their emotional functioning, um, if they had enough support in their current system, and then what they needed from us, right? Um, and so we listened to that. Um, we also listened um, through our partner ecosystem. So I keep mentioning this partner ecosystem. I meet with our partners about every six weeks. Um, we do have over 60 partners um, that we engage with regularly. Um, this one happened on June 21st. And we ask the question of what's your greatest hope for the upcoming school year? And what you'll hear, you'll see from them is they'll talk, they're talking about support for students, support for family, um, social emotional support. Um, through our PVUSD thought exchange, um, we had 455 participants. And I know I presented all, this already, but you'll see that they were asking for social emotional support for us, right? making sure that we were hiring people, that we were supporting what they needed. Um, today, I was speaking to KION about safety, and I was talking about not only physical safety, but social emotional safety, and how we're going to do the restorative start and all these other mitigation factors to support both of those. And so um, I had mentioned before that we were going to be talking about youth truth, um, so what we heard from Youth Truth, which is on the right, what we heard from Youth Truth is actually our students, which was fairly amazing. It shows the great support that our staff did for our students. It actually went up over a pandemic. So our students felt more connected than ever before. And so we're proud of that. But we also want you to look at the high school and the middle school went up tremendously. 
But look at the high school. You still have 50 percent of your students that don't feel supported, right? You still have almost forty percent of your middle schoolers that still don't feel supported, right? So what we know is we have work to do in order to continue. And then you look at what our um, our district wellness teams found that we have significant numbers. That is that number is accurate. Eight hundred. 800 students expressed stress and anxiety over this last year, right? And that was stress and anxiety to a level that it necessitated them going through a wellness team. It wasn't just stress and anxiety, and I feel it, but I can function. But that's 800 children that really weren't functioning because of that. We talked about grief and loss. Look at that. That's 500, over 550 students had engaged with a wellness team just on grief and loss, right? Um, and so what we knew is that we weren't going to be able to stand by. Um, I'm presenting down in San Diego on the 10th on this very thing because now everyone is scurrying to get this done. And guess what? We had this plan since March. We had this plan since April. And um, so we really have expanded our focus to whole child, whole family, whole community. So we always like to say how much ahead we are. This talks about how ahead we are. Now everybody is talking about whole child. We were talking in 2019 in our state of a district, if you reread it, we were talking about the whole child approach. In 2020, we were talking about checking on the whole child. Now everybody else is talking about whole child, and we're like, no, we moved on. We know that it's not just whole child. What we know is it's whole child, whole family, whole family. And now that's the focus for these couple of years. And so we're, we're laying the groundwork for really trans systematic, systemic transformation. What we keep hearing is we don't have to go back to having things be like it used to be. We can actually have things change and create a safer, more caring, equitable learning environment. And so you'll see these guiding principles. We always develop these guiding principles. Um, and this was done with staff. So and Chris will talk about it in a minute. This wasn't just done at the administrative level. We had teachers. We had um, staff that was helping social emotional counselors that was helping with this. But we believe in the guiding principles because we're not always going to, during this whole year that we focus on this, we're not always going to agree on how we should get there. But if we have these guiding principles, then we can go back to these guiding principles and say, let's reground ourselves in what we believe and then make a good decision off that. Um, and so you'll see the guiding principles, which um, I will let you see um, illustrated in um, what Chris is going to do. Yeah. One by the Good evening once again. Uh, huge thank you to the amount of teachers, behavioralists, uh, psychologists, TOSAs, our coordinator of student services, the amount of hours that went into what you're about to see to really prepare for our kids and prepare for our staff um, was tremendous over the summer. So, uh, you know, again, can't say enough about their work and what we've been able to pull together in terms of looking at our adults as well. So one of the things noted, and you can see within that, is we have really twofold pieces within the restorative start. Preparing, preparing for the students, which means making sure that we're seeing our adults and their needs within our SEL system, as well as training our adults to be prepared for our students to come back. The other pieces that we really looked at was how do we support students directly through explicit lessons, as well as school-wide activities. So tonight, I'll be going through some of those pieces and showing you samples of that work. It's nowhere in the entirety of what you actually would see, but I will show those snippets and those pieces so you can get an idea of how deep the work really went. Over to the right-hand side there, you'll see those infamous acronyms that always pop up in education. I did put them in the slide deck as well so that you could reference them. None of the materials that you see were things that were just haphazard. They were harvested from research and developed pieces that have been used within education. Most notable, CASEL is at the top of the list there. They are our most notable piece in terms of research and development for social-emotional learning. 
You'll also see the CDE material. Just recently, the CTSL, which is really the transformative SEL framework, came out from uh, California Department of Education. It was a little bit of a late arrival, but we were able to get that in as well and crosswalk it to the five domains. So we'll be able to show that in addition. Uh, you are familiar with PBIS at this point, and then Sanford Harmony, TCI, and CPI are both of our trauma pieces that we use within the district. So we're also synthesizing to training that people have already had. And then in addition, West Ed. And our last piece, which was the inequities group work during COVID, encompassed about 32 members within the district, really published a piece on how do we create those connections and that student elevation of voice. So those pieces that Dr. Rodriguez talked about with that jump in connection was highly related to that work. So they've also been involved in this process. And with that, really preparing ourselves for students, you'll see the note uh, within Castle's argument of the need for adult SEL. If you research adult SEL or go online and start to drop it into the websites, you're not going to find much. There is a need for it, but there aren't a, tr a tremendous amount of resources for it. What they're calling out for is the need to be able to have the conversations and give space to adults to make sense of what's occurred and to also be able to prepare for our students. So how do we help heal our adults in the system as well? In this particular case, not just our certificated, but our classified staff as well. How do we bring people back in a safe environment and allow them to have voice of the journey that they've gone through? That we've actually encompassed the five domains. So at the center point of this graphic, this you've seen within our PBIS cycle as well, you'll see those five major points. Self-awareness, self-management, responsible decision-making, relationship skills, and then that social awareness part. What we're focusing on, and it won't be the first touch point or the end touch point for us, but what we're going to look at is valuing the adult journey that's just happened. So as our folks come back and our teachers and our classified are meeting with us on the 9th and 10th as we are joined back together, it's about building out opportunities for their reflection, acknowledging the experiences that they've all just gone through, and really exploring what is the difference between the question of why and what. So there is a piece within this that we walk through activities of looking at when we ask why, what does that trigger us to do versus asking what, and really giving the folks time to be able to reflect on one moves us forward and one keeps us where we're at. So how do we reflect on both and still be able to have conversations with each other about what we want to have on our campuses as adults in support of each other and in support of our students? And then lastly, an opportunity to really collaborate with their peers as well. Within that, we also have training needs. So within, within what we know is that our part one of trauma last year left our teachers more hungry for what is trauma part two. So give us more resources. We want to use them for our kids. We want to be equipped with what we may be facing. So within trauma part two, what our folks will see, and I'll pull out a couple of specific pieces here. They're going to be able to see a, really an emphasis, and trauma is a large category, as all of you guys know. So what we did was break this into the second piece of it, which focuses on classroom routines. This goes for our adults as well. You can imagine the impact of teaching virtually for the past year and a half and coming back and now having a seven-hour day in direct contact with kids where you can't walk out and use the restroom. You can't push the pause button. All of those things are very, very different but they're very real. And the impacts of everybody coming back and going, the difference between you being on vacation and those first few days back, we've just had a year and a half of people having an adjustment to their schedule and having to reorder themselves. So we're gonna focus on classroom routines that both help adults as well as our students be able to really look at the impacts that they've had and get acquainted and patient with each other. We'll also take a look at classroom environments. So perfect example of that was the information that you got on Life Lab. We know that environment plays a role in how kids and adults respond. So as we're going through these pieces with trauma, we will be having conversations with our teachers. We'll be reflecting on their classroom environments, even having them reflect on how they feel within different environments. Is it a chaotic piece? Is it not? So a lot of the experiential components that we typically would do with kids will also be done with the adults so that they can feel that and resonate with it in themselves. We'll also look at that self-awareness piece which will be probably the, the largest push. Can we be patient with each other? Administrators, teachers, students, families, we're all in a learning curve. 
we're all coming back. There's expectations. There's high expectations to just make everything as normal as possible. So how do we recognize that in each other and still give each other space to say, we're going to be faulty at times. We're going to blow things because we're not used to it. And really get back to the idea of being able to give each other that gratitude and that grace so that we can recover together as a team too. Another example of a piece that we're going through with trauma is the de-escalation function. So this is, again, preventative. What are those pieces that we could do? Heavy note on the left-hand side on the second bullet, teaching and reteaching those practices. There's going to be frustrations. The answer isn't taking kids out of class. The answer isn't I'm going to get upset and my level rises because I can't take that break. So things like tagging in other teachers, what are your supports look like with your APs and your principals? We're going to be able to provide supports on both levels to give folks that space to ask for help when things aren't okay. Other pieces, the in-the-moment strategies, being able to kind of reflect and stay calm. We know that there are going to be things that, that go wrong. That was a big push on why we did summer as well, to transition kids back in an effective way. We did see things at Camp Connect. We did see things in second session, and we worked through them. The easy answer, file an office referral and let's send the kid home. That's not the answer. So I think what we did learn was let's have compassion for each other on both sides to be able to get through really a, a transition that's smooth for everybody. Supportive student experiences. So when we talk about supportive student experiences, we learned a lot. We learned a tremendous amount during COVID. And some of these lessons that we learned, really, we don't want to forget. So the data and what Dr. Rodriguez indicated through the surveys of Youth Truth and other surveys that we ran last year was really indicative of what were we seeing. We're seeing stress management. We're seeing you know, anxiety. We're seeing kids not feel like they are seen during this time. So what we've done is we've created six anchor strategies within those domains. Those you'll see up here in terms of where we're anchoring our restorative work. So honoring identity, creating the, that positive relationship through belonging. We'll be focusing on peer-to-peer -peer, because that is the area that has also been a little bit ruffled during the COVID line. Managing stress, developing empathy, making responsible decisions through their agency. So how do they use their voice, both adults and kids, to say, I'm not okay, or this is what's happening and I need to get some assistance here. I'm struggling with. And then last, the cultivating of mind mindfulness. Are you aware of what your needs may be? And have you really been able to sit in that and know what those are? And for many of our folks, we don't leave space for that voice to come out. So what we're going to take a look at is within those six strategies, that last bucket down there, kids will have two different experiences. So this is really what do we want as the PVUSD experience to make sure that all of our kids have these healing opportunities as well. Two forms of that is really an explicit SEL lesson. So that means we are actually teaching about the emotion. We're actually teaching about the process. We're teaching breathing techniques, whatever that may look like for the lesson. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples with that as well. It also means that you have school-wide supportive activities that gain momentum around those things. So as we teach self-management, how do we practice that on the playground? How do we go through helping kids to learn those pieces in live time as well? So this is really where a, a large bucket of time was spent, which was how do we assist teachers? Because if you were faced with, and now, SEL. So we need you to develop lessons, and they need to be research-based, and hope for the best, and by the way, you may not have all of the data, go do it. So what we do know is that not everybody is an expert at this, and we have people at all different levels of engagement. I could hand this to any one of us, and we all have different levels of engagement with teaching adults, teaching kids, and then also that next level of saying, is it even your wheelhouse and your expertise? So how it reads to folks is imperative as to whether they got the message or not. So what we are looking at is it can't be haphazard where we choose, we pick and choose whether students get the material. So how do we make it meaningful for teachers to have options? So one of the things that you see in front of you, and you will see the vertical alignment at the top up there, those anchor pieces, which is what we just kind of went through, are those six anchors that we're tying the work to. Within it, you'll see a lesson line. So off to the side there, your green arrow indicates the lessons that we're going through or what those title pieces are. To the, to the left, you'll see the terminology menu of plug and play additional resources. These are lessons that are already completed and already done for teachers. But we also know that teachers like the freedom and the autonomy to be able to pick and choose resources as well. So I'll show you a sample of the middle school breakout one. 
as we move forward. And then the bottom piece, which we'll also cover, is so what are some sample, uh, sample activities that are going to be happening on campuses? So this is the middle school version of the layout. This is an overview shot. All of those pieces that you guys are currently seeing underlined are actually hyperlinked for teachers as well. So as they get the overview, they have options. So they can clearly see our intent across the top with what those anchor pieces are that we want students to be able to interact with. There's also the lesson and the activity that goes with that lesson. They're designed to be 30 minutes, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, two lessons per week for the first three weeks. Uh, as we go through the process and look at what those outcomes are, we have currently four teachers in the second session also using the materials and giving us feedback on if we need to shift things. But the beauty of this is really in the additional resources and those that want to go further. So if we have folks, and we absolutely do have teachers that have been invested in SEL for quite some time, and they want to move forward or faster or deeper, they can do so. All of the additional resources that you see up there are vetted within the companies that you saw initially with the research and develop pieces. So anything within here, a teacher can say, I know you want me to be working on the identity piece. Here's a sample piece that you can use and it's plug and play. So the slide decks are done, the activities are done. If they choose not to and they want to go to one of the other activities, it still encompasses and hits the same framework piece that we're looking for. So certainly a lot of opportunities. In the first two days of schools, teachers will also have opportunities to be able to collaborate with each other, whether that is in grade level span, whether it's in departments, but our, our principals and folks will be giving them time to go through the resources as well so that they get comfortable with the material. This is a restorative journal. So we've even been able to go to the next place with the lesson, which is really allow it to be interactive with our students. Every one of our secondary folks um, really felt like they've gotten used to the habit of having things in electronic format. We'd really like the extensions to be there as well. What you're seeing on the left-hand side is really the six scope lessons. This would actually get delivered through our Gmail accounts to our students, which means they actually can work interactively within these lessons as well. And at the top, uh, you see activity one. It included the video or whatever the main component of the lesson was hyperlinked for the student too. So if there was a struggle or you needed to go back and listen to it yourself to kind of move through the material again, you could. So again, another way for us to be able to go back and say, you know, I, I, she may not be feeling well. Can we take a look? Let's see what's been, been written to be able to allow us to get more insight as to how to help. This piece is the school-wide piece that I discussed earlier. We had a first edition, which really was that student connection and elevation of voice. This really next edition dove much deeper into what did we need for that restorative piece. You'll see it framed around the identity, agency, and belonging. So those same six core values and anchors that we had previously. These are all designed to be activities, and I'm going to jump into one here so that you can see. But a few of the pieces up here that you will see, they are all aligned to activities that have either been done in our schools last year that got great remarks from our kids with connection or have the opportunity to be able to um, really explore a couple others that happen in other districts that got resounding events. The cool part with these is that they're designed for the leadership as well as your ASB folks, your activities folks. Lots of our sites have many people involved in this work, including our PBIS teams. The design of the actual guide allows them, and this is one that's around the mindful card decks and the embedded SEL, so Sanford Harmony, and then the mindful games that we did during COVID time. It gives them, just to orient you to what these look like, it gives them the activity tile. We put a virtual, uh, I'm sorry, a visual sample in there so people could see and kind of have that reminder. We also wrote down the purpose of why you would do that within your campus, including the preparation. Within the preparation, you'll also see those hyperlinks again. So you're getting that plug and play model where if you are invested in that, if your leadership team decides we want to go down this path and use this as one of our supporting materials, they have access to it. That includes also who may be doing it within our district. So if VA Hall is doing something really, really cool that we're highlighting, you also have the contact information for those administrators to get more information as well. And then the last piece, we included a classroom extension that maybe your whole school isn't invested in just this one. A teacher could use these pieces too and morph it into a classroom extension. And last but not least, pulling in the community aspect of how do we actually package that and assist our families in being part of the process. So I would always pick up my daughter from school and I'd say, how was school? And the answer was fine. And that's where the conversation ended for the most part. 
until I got better at realizing that I'm asking the wrong question. So what we're really looking at and what we're trying to, to elicit is how do parents play a part in this process? So on the 12th, we'll be hosting a Zoom. Uh, it will be completed with raffle prizes. We will do it in both Spanish as well as English. And we'll have breakout groups by secondary and elementary. The idea behind it is to give parents an understanding of, yes, the overview of that restorative piece, but also how do they play a role. So as your kids are going through these six lessons and getting information about their belonging and their identity, what are the things that I can now ask when I go pick up my daughter and say, hey, instead of how was your day and I get a fine, I, I know you're doing one of the lessons on identity and, you know, what were some of the activities that you did? Now it's like, wait, you know what I did at school? So we're, what we're trying to do is really elicit the idea that our parents can absolutely be engaged in the process of healing and getting that smooth transition for our kids. Um, and definitely working closely with our parent engagement group. Um, but again, that will be Zoom, both language, um, as well as secondary and elementary. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Do we have any public? No. Do we have any? I know, I just want to, as a from a parent perspective, I want to thank you for the parent workshop. You know, even as somebody who's experienced, like I, you know, I've got three kids. Not my first rodeo, but it's like I haven't been a parent global pandemic before. <laughs> you know, so there's a lot to learn, and and I just appreciate you know that. I mean, it's. <laughs> Pressure. <laughs> I agree with you. Um, so I do have a question for you. So focus on the uh, Where the child goes. So every single department, every single employee will be receiving the training and going through that on August 9th and 10th. And every division and department, including like our transportation, is doing um, something with their um, with their staff. So um, whether you are a two-year-old in our system or you are in adult education in our system, um, you will wind up moving through this process. So everyone's receiving. Yeah. Wow. That's tremendous. for the rest um i really i have this site that i subscribe to. you might know it is good out of you mom link You had something like that with all the different columns, but even like in communication department, mom, they probably love you. And there, by the way, they came um, and sent suicide sent that they're here. That's always ready in this. Right. Absolutely. Thank you. I have one okay. question. <laughs> um, so thank you. I know this has been a lot of work that everybody's doing. Um, 
Domi was always asking about websites. Are we going to have a space designated on our website for to go about part of? Yeah, so as Chris was mentioning, we're currently piloting some of these items within with our students now. And so once it's solidified, um, then um, we will wind up, um, it already is on our website already in um, underneath the return to school, um, but we will amplify that and we will wind up putting all this, um, all the translated items um, we'll put in there in English and Spanish. But um, yeah, we will wind up getting it on our, our Thank you. Um, tremendous <laughs> presentation, tremendous work. I would agree with just the work done into it. Um, I really have to say that, <clears throat> you know, some employers are really doing a good job of getting it right on this trend back to work, having sensitivity with that. And unfortunately, others, but it is a whole. So, um, being one of the largest school districts in the state, largest in the region, second largest employer in the county, largest employer in the city of Watson, I'm glad to see that the leadership is taking with some of that sensitivity and that training with our faculty, as well as, of course, students, the parents, the families. The, with regards to that Zoom workshop that's on mm -hmm. the 12th, um, do you foresee that there might be some sort of a follow-up with that within like a week or two? And I mean, not big, long span of time, but sort of either, a, or, uh, well, uh, one I was thinking for also one of the parents that miss it inevitably, but also sort of, if you will, like check in one within a week or two or so is that. Yeah, we're actually going to do a couple of things. So we, we certainly look at the numbers of the capacity of the, the folks that we do have show up. At the end of the session, we're actually going to build in a piece that allows for additional questions. We're capturing all the questions to then feed what could come next. So as we have more questions about how would I approach my student if I think they're going to be completing you know, self-harm or my student's coming back but not doing so well. As those things kind of come up, when they get past the, the tips and tricks, so to speak, of, of how to make that smooth transition with our parents, we're going to take note of those pieces, develop something in alignment with those, okay. have those folks come back too. But we don't see it as, as a one and done in terms of touch points. I think what we have learned with even COVID is we get a lot of parents that will join in Zooms because it's so much more convenient. Um, I did three myself last year because I was thinking, I'll just jump, jump into this one and be a parent on, in the wall instead. And it never ends that way for me because I end up getting pulled into the conversation. But I think the, the beauty of it is that it allows people to have more access to it. So I don't think that what we will see is a return to that brick and mortar piece of once a year and gathering. There's benefit to both. So I do see it as part of a, a series of being able to be responsive to parents and say, as we come out of one and we get this information of what their needs are again, then we reboot and be able to offer a different one. Yeah, I, I think a check definitely yep. more than an annual, not even six months. I wasn't even thinking a month was possible <laughs> to do it. I mean, because I, I, all of us who've been parents and have kids in those first few weeks, it's rough enough, let alone all of this component. And, you know, and also if we have, I mean, let's face it, if we have teachers and faculty staff that are also going to their own milk, I think that the check in major um, part of that follow-up process and then it's meaningful um the other part dr rodriguez i think just she touched on it briefly about that with regards to the transportation department but i also wanted to be sure that because that was really directed towards our teachers returning and of course a m majority of our classified employees have been the frontline workers who've been keeping this district running during that um 16 month period where we were out um, but I also want to make sure that they're not overlooked just, well, oh, they've been here, right? But they've also been here in a lot of empty schoolhouses and a lot of empty facilities. And for that rush back in for them and the feelings and the anxieties, things they could be feeling in their workplace, I think that that needs to be recognized across the whole, whole not just. Yeah, um, no, it will be in every single department. Okay. So we're training all of week. our principals. I'm sorry? In that week, 
And yeah, so we're training all of our leadership on August 6th. Um, and then um, they are doing it um, during that first week. Nine, ten. Yep. Okay. So everybody I, I will just wind wanted... up being, and this is an ongoing, so it is, we call it a restorative start the first three weeks. But as our, our, our yearly theme denotes, um, this is going to be something that is ongoing. And then going back to one of my slides with the systemic transformation, we really see this as being something that will then change us permanently, right? Um, not even just for this year, but as we learn to do better, um, we'll continue to do better. Right. And I just also had a question on one of the slides that since on Dr. Rodriguez, what was the bar graph with the survey and you talked about eight students, five, um, those different groups with the different things that were um, noted about those different students. Were those all different students or were some of those 550 on that one bar graph, they have been in that 800 bar graph as well? Do you know if they were duplicative? I do. They, they are duplicative in some cases. So you will see somebody that may have anxiety, but also one of the other factors that was up there as well. That is true. So you, do you find any important factors? We do. We have it at a, a deeper level. So one of the things that we will be doing as well is continuing to move forward with our wellness team. So some of, some of the, the indicators that we're using and the metrics that we're using going forward is to look at those four spans and add a two additional spans that when we come back would be relevant to us coming back. So we are looking through that. We're also looking deeper to subgroups and other folks as well to say, can we track those and actually figure out which students may need kind of more of the wraparound service where there's multiple things going on or the anxiety is being triggered by one of the other pieces too. Well, I look forward to hopefully hearing a report back around September about how it's going. Yeah, we, we, we have established eight key, we call them KPIs, which is key performance indicators. Um, and so we'll, we'll present that to the board so they're able to see that. Thank you. I just also wanted to say thank you for the report. It, you know, it was easy to understand with the dashboard, the colors. Um, it, it makes it easy for myself, but also makes it easier to the community. You know, Sometimes we have these reports, papers, ordinary parents just, just think. And, but now with this, people and parents can go back and say, okay, I can get this. Or if they have questions, they can come back to us. Um, I also just want to say thank you, too, for going to the parents. You know, before COVID or also during COVID, uh, you know, I talked about many times I've joined Zoom, you know, at many white and 30, 40, 50 so us going to their, you know, going into their homes and trying to reach out to them, say, "Hey, we're here. Here are these resources." Um, I, I think that's great. I think this coming I mean, Zoom informational meeting that you have, and I just also wanted to say thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, and thank you, Cabinet, for leading the way. You know, as you mentioned earlier, that states are realizing they have to make this up now, and whereas you guys, team. Um, are ahead of the game, and now other districts are looking at you guys. So I just wanted to thank you for putting us on the map in a good way. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. All right, we'll move on to item 10.5, our update on Alex and Math Accelerator. The report will be presented by Araceli Mendez, Medical. Okay, I'm gonna get situated with the um, with the microphone here and the clicker. So, good evening, um, President Holm. I know she left, so I'll greet her again. Um, Board of Trustees and Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for having me back. I was here with you in February, and you requested an update on not only Alex but Map Accelerator. So, I'll be presenting that to you tonight. As you might remember, Alex was used primarily at Pajaro Middle last year. And so this slide here just presents you with a summary of, you know, a reminder of what the program is. Um, and 
what um, what it helps um, how it helps our students learn. And so we know that it's a web based program, and um, it's an we we call it an intelligent online program because it will adjust the learning path for students based on their performance. And we you know the types of questions that students see are not only just multiple choice questions, but also um, input types of questions where students can enter their response. Um, so, and then another piece as a reminder for Alex is that it's periodically assessing students to ensure that they are retaining information. And it does that through the knowledge checks. And so the topics are being moved from this learn section into a mastery section. And that is what gives kids um, progress on completing the course. And so the first data set that we are going to examine is our usage for Alex at all the grade levels at Pajaro Middle. And so this pie graph, um, sorry, the pie graph here presents us with the usage for all of the students at four different levels. And so you might be wondering, well, how were those levels created? So we, um, our, our weekly usage goal that we established was 45 minutes per week. And then we took that times the number of instructional weeks for the school year and came up with just a, a distribution to be able to categorize the data. And so ideally, if students were meeting that 45 minute usage goal, then we would see them in that level four, right? So over the span of the school year, that's 1,486 minutes or higher. A level three is pretty close, right? Like the range of minutes is wide. So if, if just because they're in a level three, it doesn't mean that they weren't meeting the usage goal. They, were, they could have been close. Um, on the next slide, we have this usage data by grade level. And so sixth grade students, um, you've probably already, you know, creating some wondering questions about the data that you're seeing. And so something to note is that this is the grade level that even in February when I was here, we, we saw that we were struggling, right, that to meet our usage. And um, Although we see that high percentage of a level one, I think, you know, a, a, a piece of information to be aware of is that this grade level in particular did go through some staff changes in the middle of the school year. Um, and so there was that. And then the things that we discussed back in February is this where our young sixth graders, right, at doing middle school and distance learning. Um, and then here we see our seventh grade data. Um, and so we start to see how our percentages are shifting, right? So we really see 35% at a level four and then 7% at a level three. So our usage is improving. And then this slide, we have eighth grade. And again, we see oh, that person got sorted for you. Um, that green one is 4%. Um, and so we see a nicer distribution across the levels here. And then, so this is the usage overall. And so now that we know that students are using the program, then we took a, uh, you know, we examined uh, what was the percent of topics, you know, of course completion that students actually achieved? And so the next um, slide, you will see that distribution. And so a note here is to note that everything is in percent and the final level is representing the final level achieved by students. And uh, apologies that you can't see level four. That is 70% or higher. And so, again, these levels were once again just created to be able to categorize the data. So we set those um, ranges locally. And the target goal is 
to have students be anywhere between a level two and a level three. And that is true because Alex was used as a supplemental program to core instruction. It was not our only means of um, for the students to learn, right? Um, so the first, I don't know, the first pie graph here, that's all of the students, and then we see the data disaggregated by grade level. Um, and the next slide, we have um, a comparison to our NWEA map achievement level. And what you are going to see is these bubble charts right and so they'll be on an x y axis so this you know i just want to summarize what we're about to see the x axis is our alex levels that force percentage completion and then the y axis we're going to see our nwea map achievement levels and those are delineated based on the ranges of percentile achievements that you see here at the bottom And something got really um, funky because they're not seeing colors. So those bubbles are supposed to be in color. Oh, it's there. They have it. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Um, so, um, so here what you are looking at, and I'm going to look at my slide here um, just so that the colors, because I'm making reference to them, is we have all of the three grade levels. And so the first statement that we see is 31% of students demonstrated average or better performance on NWEA. And so what that means is if we look at our, our graph here, the NWEA levels, the one and the two are coded over here. And so those are up to the 40th percentile, which based on the norm study, that's not considered being, you know, performing at grade level. So we really want to take a look at level three. So level three here on NWEA, so from left to right, um, if we look across, so imagine there's the line and then we look above at all those bubbles above the, the level three. That is where that 31% is coming from. And then we have it broken down by, well, if they were between a level two and a level three on the course completion, right? They were actually using the program. How many of those students are performing uh, um, average or better? And so that's the breakdown here. Um, and then for the second statement, 56% demonstrated low to low average performance on NWEA. Those are the bubbles that you see the red and the orange on your screen. And those are the ones below an imaginary line here across the two. Okay, and they're going to switch it so that we can all look at the color. Uh, great, yeah, perfect. And then, so this um, data set here is the same scenario, right? But now we're just looking at our sixth graders. And so um, we do see that if we think of it, one way that I like to think about this data set is um, thinking about a line here on the um on the NWEA out of three, because that is indicating that our students are performing above um, or close to grade level. And then for Alex progress, we really wanted them between a level two and a level three, because that means that they completed at least 50% of the course. And so if we put a, a line here, then we can have this quadrant chart that we can take a look at the data. Ultimately, the goal is to get more of the bubbles to go up and to the right. And so in the next slide for seventh grade, um, 
we start to see that increase and then definitely with eighth grade here eighth grade is a great visual for how that data is changing and how we are moving um ideally we want to see right like this eight the green bubbles up here on this upper quadrant And so then um, one of the things that the last time there was a question about is, well, what does all this mean, right? Like we're having the students use this program. We have students who are not using the program. So can we have an, um, some information as to what that data looks like? And so the next set of um, slides is what that's presented to you is a comparison of um, students who used Alex on the left versus students who did not use Alex. And so again, the percent below represent the final percentile band level on our NWEA map, our spring data. And so for example, what we would see is 1% of the students um, ended up at a level five in achievement. And that means that is a pretty um, high percentile, right, greater than the 80th percentile. So I really like to look at level three and level four on this data set because that means that we are looking at level three and four, so the yellow and the green. So those two here. So that's 30% compared to 20... I should be able to do the math, 25 on the um, non-users of Alex. And so we go on to the next slide. Can I control it? On the next slide, oh, the previous one? There we go. So here's seventh grade. And so with seventh grade, again, um, the visual here is, you know, thinking about even the kids that use Alex in the level one, right? Like we have 43% in that level versus 47 at the district. And then the next one is eighth grade. And definitely we can see um, the distribution of the percentage for eighth grade. And um, so this slide here concludes the information for Alex um, in terms of the course progress that students completed and the analysis on NWEA map. I can pause for questions on this section or should I move on to Map Accelerator? Do any trustees have any questions? No, I just mostly have a comment. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. Yeah. Promise before, but also it was busy year last year. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you for acknowledging that. I appreciate it. And and do know that it is a work in progress and so we continue to revisit with the school site and the team to improve. Okay, so on to Map Accelerator. Um, I, you know, let me say one more thing. The eighth grade graph by chart much better. That just, yeah, see where potential building or you had a... Yes, and so one thing that we plan to do with our um, school team is really looking at what worked well in eighth grade so that we can spread it at the school. Right, because it's the same as the math department, and so um, how can we foster those good things that that grade level did? Okay, so that is not it. So let's keep going. Oh, I have. Wait. <laughs> there we go. There it is. Um, okay, so we are on to Map Accelerator and. You guys all probably remember that we were one of four pilot districts in the nation to 
years ago. And so that was the, the school year where schools closed. So the implementation during the pilot, right, being a pilot itself, it's a little rocky. Like everyone's learning. We're learning. The company's learning. The developers are learning. And then schools close. Um, and so with Map Accelerator, as you might remember, um, it is an online program that provides a personalized learning path for students based on their NWEA MAP score. And so every time that we receive, that we administer the assessment, um, the data gets sent to MAP Accelerator and the learning path for students is readjusted based on those scores at the four different um, instructional areas where we have the data point for. And so for Map Accelerator, um, what we are going to look at is the end of year achievement levels again for our spring data. And we are going to have a, um, a comparison as well. So we're going to begin by looking at third grade. And so the percentile rank range here is at the bottom. So when we're talking about, well, what are the levels, right? They're right here. And again, it's the same color coding uh, as we saw in Alex. And so we're really targeting our attention to that level three, I would say. That's a good um, way to, to narrow the, the focus here. And so for third grade, this represents the data set for students that use Map Accelerator in comparison to the non-users, so those that did not use the program and how they did on Map. Um, on our NWEA map assessment. And so you can see the other level three, which is achieving pretty close or above to grade level between the 41st and 60th percentile. We had 16% compared to 12%. Um, and then you also see the level one out of 49 compared to 59. And then we have fourth grade. Um, and a similar comparison, right? Like 17% compared to 14. And then we have fifth grade here as well. And that is the information that I have for you tonight. And I will take any questions. Thank you. Uh, Okay, yeah, oh, right. <laughs> a reminder, I appreciate that. So, so, no public yeah. so I, I know it's late. I just want to make one comment. What we know about digital programs is that they will only work if we are using them to the capacity and the usage in which they are intended for. So just like the comment about eighth grade um, in terms of Alex, you saw that was the group that used it to its highest level, and so we saw the highest impact. So although this data is challenging, um, what I would say is, is persistence pays off. So we need to persist, continue to change people's practices, and include digital learning materials, and do so when we are doing it in person. Because we are, we were expecting children to independently self-motivate to use these programs versus when we have them in front of us, we can actually encourage them to use it. So um, I just want to say that because sometimes there's a, a reaction to say, okay, let's stop something that doesn't, although this shows that it is working to a degree, um, is to stop something. Um, when it hasn't yet been solidified. And so I just encourage us to continue and persist um, because anything in its first year um, and is not going to have the impact that we want, especially if we don't use it to the level in which it's scientifically in. Um. Any other questions or comments from the first? So late. 
You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. If there's further questions or comments, we will move to section 11, our consent agenda item. These are our routine items. Do we have any public speakers? To no public speakers. Are there any items that the board wishes to? All right. Can I have a motion? I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. And there are no preferred consent items. So we will go on to our, um, we'll skip 13 because we don't have closed session to reconvene, but we'll go on to 14. Uh, so our action report on consent items. Are there any items on closed session? Yes, I have um, closed session item 2.1. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by district administration on July 28th, 2021 with six and five additional action items. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Closed session item 2.2. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on July 28th, 2021 with zero and 32 additional actions. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimous. Um, item 2.6. Special education settlement for one student. The board approved an agreement for a special education student with seven zero votes. Item 2.7, special education settlement for a student. The board approved an agreement for a special education student with six one vote. I have one announcement. On behalf of our superintendent and district administration, we are pleased to announce Mr. Gary Vargas, appointment supervisor, maintenance and operations. Mr. Vargas brings to the Pajaro Valley Unified School District a wide breadth of experience in facilities, planning, mechanics, project management, and grounds maintenance. Mr. Vargas comes to the district from Santa Clara University, where he built his career for 23 years in the various capacities of landscaping, small engines, <laughs> and for the past 14 years as supervisor, grounds maintenance. Mr. Vargas approaches his work with a yes mentality and always looks for student solutions to problems. He is a communicative, detailed, oriented, organized, and fully committed to the work. He looks forward to serving the students of the Pajaro Valley Unified School District and continuing the good work of improving district facilities. We are proud to welcome Mr. Vargas to our district as the new supervisor and Thank you. All right, our upcoming meetings. Um, our next meeting will be a special board meeting closed session uh, regarding the superintendent's evaluation. And our next regular board meeting will be on August 25th of 2021. And with that, the meeting is adjourned at 11.04.